Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total protonic reversal. Protonic reversal. Protonic reversal with your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and cover power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's the It means something. It means something. You know, that's my take on it. Like, what's yours? Protonic reversal! That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed it is. It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact that we're all up in your face. It is time once again for the one, the only protonic reversal welcome to it welcome to it welcome to it uh second show of 2023 we got the incredible martin bc uh producer engineer uh pro- pro- proprietor proprietor sure of the martin bc band who came out the great record uh feral myths uh just right at the tail end of, of last year really interesting dude and and very excited to have him on uh so thanks for thanks for tuning in everybody uh, before we get rolling with it too hard, uh, just a little bit of an introduction. Welcome to Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. I am your host, Conan Neutron. I'm a rock and roll lifer who has toured and recorded for the last 23 years. Most known for the band Conan Neutron, The Secret Friends. Music is a huge part of my life, and I use the format of this very long-running podcast to talk about music with musicians whose work I enjoy and respect. Folks, the may or may not be household names, but do something very special. This is episode 319. Wow. If this is your first time listening to the show, all of the archives are at protonicreversal.com and are always free. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. And if you'd like to support the show and get episodes sooner, you can give a dollar a month to patreon.com slash protonicreversal. And if you like the show or even just a single episode, please feel free to share it along, like, subscribe, or post a review. All of that helps people find the show. And it's just a darn nice thing to do right on okay so uh let's uh get right down to it um let's let's uh throw on mr martin bc how you doing sir welcome to the show hey conan you see me Uh, thanks so much for joining me man um it's it's uh it's good to see you i was jamming feral myths uh, a little bit earlier and uh i'm i'm stoked to have you come on to talk about it a lot of a lot of folks on here, a lot of collaborators, a lot of um, different uh, musicians and things along those lines. You've worked with so many people over the years and you know so many people. How do you do you have like a running list of like, OK, well, this person does this. Uh, uh, it'd be great to do something with this person. Like, how do you even correlate? Are you a meticulous note taker? Like, how how does this all come to pass? Well, for one thing, it's, it's being having a recording studio in New York City. A, a lot of people just pass through here. There's all kinds of stuff, side projects, people guesting on something else. So it's it, it's actually not that surprising to me that I've ended up. You know, some of the that some of the uh, maybe better known people might not even remember even having been here or whatever. It's you know, just like Madonna was here once. Or oh, no kidding. Twice. Does she remember the studio? I don't know. So yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's not that unusual. It's it's also it's also why I for me I believe having um uh the recording studio in a busy place like New York City. It's just it's kind of my model, you know. It's uh, I I don't which is a, a topic of course with all this displacement and it's kind of common for a recording studio to be in a, in a place like upstate New York where they have plenty of room and all this kind of stuff. But then you're you know if I'm also living there, I'm not tapped in. And there's not a lot of happenstance, the stuff you're talking about. Um, but also, you know, it's uh, I, I go to shows a lot. Like I, that I'm dedicated. That's maybe you could say that's part of my mo. Is I'm dedicated to going to a lot of shows, usually local. So I actually don't even go to a lot of um, shows of national or international acts. Right. I go to local shows. 
um, see DIY where I can like meet people and it's, it's just more enjoyable to me and more interesting. And I, um, I like being able to talk to people, get to know them. So sometimes I court people and yet mm-hmm. through knowing them a little bit and having shown interest in them, they might recommend me to their friends or whatever. So there's a whole sure. yeah, way that absolutely. that works and becomes a network. So the, so the people in my network that have maybe, um, and then I try to invite them here because there's people ha- that have not recorded here that are my network. I said, look, I've known you for 10 years. You've never yeah, been to the right. studio. And it's not about business. It's just because it's, it isn't, it is an interesting place. I like thinking of it as overlapping with a bit of a community center, just like I think record stores are kind of community centers. Right. So I, um, I, I've even had a few little, um, very low key live shows here, kind of like shows like maybe drone or experimental, yeah. not big, ticket shows or anything it's something like sustainable um, and usually small, you know sir, no yeah. cost and uh, yeah those are, and and it's usually well people donate to the, the few people that actually perform but it's uh more for like a bit of a i do it so actually people can hang out in the studio and sometimes that includes people that um i might have met at shows and or been here and they're like well you know we're curious because we've heard about it from friends so so it, it really is a lot of a lot of word of mouth i don't advertise for instance my my uh website very uh uh, it's very thin on the stu- on studio details. Like there's no equipment list, uh, yeah. just a few photos, and and a lot of that is is, is um actual actually because I think um I don't want anyone to come to me because of gear. I want I it's much better for me if people come either because they've heard records that they like, or yeah. because they um heard or either records that they like that are out there or records of their own friends or they got recommended from a friend of theirs all of that is better than like a cold a cold call just about yeah and you know who you're working at a tape machine or something like that yeah yeah and you're and you're excuse me what you're talking about well you know like the kind of person you're going to be engaging with right because you're part of a community and if you're part of a community like that's a big piece of it is that like you're you're (laughs) yeah well if they people that know no if they come to me for any of those reasons yeah, if they come to me for any of those reasons, it's like it's like it, we're halfway there. You know, they've already heard the stuff they like, or or they know already from whatever read word of mouth or something that we'll be able to communicate. And that's kind of crucial to me. It's being kind of on the same page, and yeah. people getting where I'm coming from is kind of important as well as my getting to know where they're coming from. Well, and you've got such a long, rich history there too. I mean, you you started in that place like what eighty one or something. Like it's 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 been like a very uh, long time. I mean, I know originally it was um, uh, you you started in like with Laswell and Eno, but like that's I mean, that's a long time to run a studio. And I remember distinctly uh, a few years back, you did the thing where you had like the records on the walls and you were kind of like going through them and stuff like that. And it was kind of just like. Jesus Christ. Like that's that's a lot of music. Like in a good way where it's like, "Oh yeah, Evil. That's my favorite Sonic Youth record. I forgot. You know, that was done there." And like the the X Models record, like the really noisy no wave industrial kind of sounding one. I was like, "Oh yeah, I love that record." Like it's and it's like through all the years having all these touchstones of that and to be part of that community of just weirdos. And I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> For that long, you're going to like you're going to make some interesting connections, I would imagine. Yeah, and there's a lot of weirdness, and you know, like I, I just did a show in uh, Boston with um, Anida, and there's, I guess, there's like a member of X Models. I'm getting a little, it's it's all, it all, it, which is good. It's complicated, right? It's like this person was in that band, or they came, or they left, or they went back. All that stuff gets very hazy, fast, cross pollinated. Kind of yeah, it's complicated, it's <laughs> organic, cross pollinated, incestuous, all of the good stuff, and um, yeah. it's uh. Yeah, so one of the X models people are now in a band. I guess they're in. Oh, no, I didn't. I did not record Oneida, but that's an example of a band that I didn't record. It, are in my network, and you know, I played with them. There's also that is playing with people and getting to know them just from doing shows together. Um, so, so, but actually, really, I, I moved into this space in 1969 and uh, started moving towards recording in like 1980, and then 1981 when was the when is when the first proper session with Eno happened. Yeah. And where it sort of became clear, could we, it was really me and Laswell and the, the, the band material, that we could start recording um, yeah. other people. And it, it started very simple. Oh, it could go, it could happen like that back in the day because there was not a whole lot of, not, there wasn't really a rule book of what, of what uh, punk or post punk or experimental or, I mean, we didn't even have the word indie or indie rock or independent rock yet. So there was yeah. no real, 
there were no reference points. I mean, I was actually sort of making it up as I went along. Literally, I would I would hear a band, like say Rat at Red R. Remember with this band Rat at Red R, which was in that sort oh, of yeah. circle wow. of you know Swans and Sonic. Yeah, and stuff. yeah, and and it's funny because I recorded them, and I was like, I, I wasn't even sure how a band like that was supposed to sound. I guess we would find out. <laughs> There's no um, rule book, right? So, there's, I mean, no, band, there's no, there's no, want... yeah, there's, there's no even, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nothing to go off of. Like you're, you're writing it, like you're, 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 you're uh, building the plane in flight to a certain degree. Yeah, exactly. There was a lot of um, documentation, but sometimes it would be like two microphones at a venue, you know, like so. Those people yeah. were dedicated recorders, and there would all, well, you, I guess you have that now with with smartphones but back then there would always be a dedicated recorder with a cassette machine and two mics that really cared about that and so there was documentation but you know what a, a the production of a record was supposed to be and that was actually contentious amongst everyone is what what is it going to be what it's going to supposed to be raw what what does even raw mean is this supposed to sound live what does live actually mean yeah. you know so i remember with rad at red r what what i decided was uh for myself was i think it should sound like it's coming through an amazing sound system in like a medium to large room yeah. That's what I want, like bigger than CBGB's. I was like, these it, CBGB's is too small to be a little bigger than CBGB's. So I was imagining that, like, just a great sound system. So I get that that feeling of so it was a bit more reverberant than what a lot of people were making, just because I was imagining it sounding like, like it was live. But it's fun to some people that sounded more produced than like a couple mics, like in like a a a, a damp in a not non reverberant room right in a, in a dampened room right so so that would be a different vision of what does live actually mean so you know like a lot of the stuff from like john spencer world like pussy pussy yeah. galore and stuff like yeah, that pussy which, i did not sure. record yeah. it's funny that was a whole little, that was a <laughs> re, that, that was a realm in new york that i i didn't record and i think that their vision of what like live would be live quote unquote would mean in a recording was different than mine so it was the, this all this was like debated amongst everyone, you know. And, and by the way, just to say, is I did end up recording one band from that whole canon of like amphetamine reptile bands, and I was very happy about that. Was uh, recording Boss Hog, that had uh, a member yeah. of a former member of Pussy Galore in it, so that was kind of nice, including Spencer. Yeah, yeah, and the a great record too. And and also, I mean, just from that world too, it's like I think it's kind of wild and cool that Spencer's uh, the hit makers. He's got Bob Burt playing with him. Right. Like he's got he's got Bob Burt doing the junk percussion again. And I don't know if they're still doing it, but like because it was early on when I saw him. But they did a few Pussy Galore songs and I was like, oh, that's great. You're doing like it's like the Elvis thing. But you like you're you in a couple of Blues Explosion songs, you're doing a couple of Pussy Galore songs. Like it was like really I, I was like, I'm glad you're doing this. This is awesome because all this music totally kicks ass. Even like Pussy Galore, it's like, you know, those records. I mean, it's pretty aggressive. It sounds like it's from a shitty broombox in an alleyway or something, but it's perfect for the music. Like it's, it's just so nasty and, and brutish and, and, and gnarly. Um, it, it, but it's wild that like, you know, you think back to the models of the kind of stuff that you were doing versus like, you know, some like maybe the British records or something. Like I think like the fall or something along those lines or gang of Four. that first gang of four record kind of crazy sounding, honestly, all things in where you're like, that's kind of a bizarre sounding record. Not that it's a, I love that record, but like as far as sound goes, I can't think of it any other way, but it's also like, I don't know what decisions were reached to get. I mean, I do because I, I talk to them about it, but like, it's just kind of like, there was no rule book for how to record that kind of music because it was so intense and new and crazy. And you wanted to, to have it presented where you get some aspect of a live show when there's a great live show. But, but what does that mean exactly? And it, it honestly, a yeah, lot of those I, records. I found all, all these words. And... Oh, they hold up. I was just gonna say. <laughs> Sorry, what were you say? I was gonna say a lot of those records still hold up too, and I mean, I, th I think that's testament to your uh, professionalism and your skill with it that they still hold up. They sound like unique in, in a way. But please, yeah, 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 respond to literally any of that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, for instance, like the Unsane record, right? Total Destruction. Perfect. Um, that's okay. one that actually has aged well because it now that's much more of a, it, it actually sounds more, cu more current now, whereas yes. back in the day, like, what was it? 1992 or something. It was, it was kind of what the fuck. And then another, another record that, that was kind of what the fuck was, um, the boredom's wow too, which I don't know, maybe a little before that 88, <sighs> 89, something like that. But you know, that, that, that was talk because that, at that, for that record, I had just acquired the huge, I guess, huge by recording studio standards, uh, space underneath the studio. Because I acquired, actually, the space behind me is where a lot of stuff was recorded. 
um, like in the early 80s. And then things started getting, you know, people started wanting, wanting bigger sounds. There wasn't so much about bigger sounds until like the late 80s. What that? What does that actually mean? People wanted to sound bigger, more, and you know there was more reverb. Reverb was suddenly actually affordable, <laughs> because before that right. it wasn't actually affordable, uh, so you could yeah. have it. In this. I mean, I, I spent like I thought I, I thought it was cheap to spend seventeen hundred dollars on a on a reverb, you know. So, you know, so when I could get at like a large room, basically underneath the studio, underneath there's like a large warehousey uh, sized room that that was. Yeah, that was kind of wow. And I remember when I had the boredoms in here, they were like fascinated by for the first time getting to record in a warehousey kind of thing. And they were like going around checking the sounds in different corners. You know, like I, the the, the boredom singer, would like stick his ear next to like in a corner, but he's okay. maybe the corner sounds a certain way. And so I don't even remember. We just went nuts with all that stuff. And the record sounds bizarre, but you know, it's, I think there was more variety in how things would sound. If you could go, you can compare that to like one of the you know pussy galore sounding type bands, it would be just a kind of night and day. But that's 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 kind of nice. It, it was all all of that was sort well, of absolutely ruined, really by by <laughs> it, it was ruined by radio friendly. I remember sonically that was probably the worst yeah. the worst kind of uh, uh, paradigm. And that was in the nineties. It was a, a bit of the toxic effect of like major labels and people actually getting signed. And uh, the radio friendly is just kind of horrible as a concept. And um, a lot of that had to do with it was implying songwriting and stuff, but also sound. And it, it was making things homogenous. So it was kind of, and it was like limiting experimentation and sound to sort of narrow, narrow zones. Um, and, and, but luckily that didn't last. You know, I think it's because the, the, de the demise of uh, things shrunk, right? I guess the, the whole Seattle. Scenes are smaller. shrunk and grunt shrunk. So then, then the rules went back out the window. What's that? Uh, yeah, because it, it's smaller now. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's <laughs> there's that mud honey song where it says, "I like it small," which I think is so perfect because it's like that's it's like a statement of intent for like this modern this modern age that we're in now. And, and but there's all kinds of weird hallmarks. So, like think about those early two thousands where it was like loudness wars, like where just everything was this brick wall mastered. Where it was like, oh my god, there's no dynamics to that at all. Like it's just like one solid waveform. And and the idea was it had to be as loud as everything as the thing before it. Everybody wanted to be louder and everything else. So you get like a a record with like any dynamics and it just gets you know uh, thrown out the window. It's it's just all like one gigantic uh, thing. And and that's a trend. And you listen back to those records and they sound nuts. It's like wow, oh my yeah, god, yeah. Right? <laughs> I know it's inc it's incredible. It's incredible. But uh, luckily that kind of went out the window just because. Because you know what yeah. they used to say, like the people that were pushing back on the loudest wars would say, that's what you have the volume knob for, right? And yeah. it's funny, like now the, the volume wars are, are mostly gone because, because Spotify and all those services, they can they can uh, even out the volumes. There's that. But then also because the volume knob is in your palm, you don't actually have to get out of your like chair just to walk the five feet over to the stereo. So weirdly enough, that made a difference. Whereas before it was like you were sunk. If someone had to get out of maybe, maybe get out of their chair to walk over and bring the volume up. Right. So <laughs> Yeah, they're too high to get to the volume knob. Exactly. But but like also it's funny to me that like if you think about that, that's that's a that's a perfect example too, because everyone has their own sort of tailored experience. And I think that that um in a way that's kind of cool because it makes it more personal to a certain degree. But I think there's a the question about whether or not the valuation is still there. But yeah, if you if a slint song comes on, you want to crank up the slint song so you can hear what the hell is going on. You know, you 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 can do that, but it's it's wild to me that to me, I feel like a lot of that two thousand stuff kind of sounds like 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 a little, sounds a little dated in a certain and specific way, like in a way that like um like in the eighties that freaking drum sound that they that they use in all the pop stuff where it's like oh my god like i know exactly when this is you hear it and you're like and then people try to emulate it where i'm like oh my god that was a horrible aesthetic decision then like and you're you're trying to emulate this later on uh one man's opinion but i think it's if you're gonna make music yeah, yeah. I'm, i mean <laughs> you know like be aware of the fact that like it's a trendy thing to do that yeah i mean don't, don't even get me started there i i think Right now, right now, it seems to me that right now is one of the most retro times that that I can remember. There's always been retro, you know, and then now yeah. I'm feeling like, um, you know, sometimes when I 
just hanging out with people younger than me and they're, they're listening to stuff that's more like like electronic music is a lot of for a lot of reasons a lot of live music now what they call live music is actually electronic music or it's almost like dj yeah. dj sets sort of in the sort of uh setting of like live music a lot of solo acts with like uh with a laptop or a drum machine all this kind of stuff and but with a, lot, a lot of the stuff i'm hearing with like drugs a lot of just I, I'm, I, at the moment, I'm a wans with drum machines, and I, it makes me almost feel like I'm retro because I insist on having a drummer. But the reality <laughs> right. is, is that a lot of those bands sound like '70s club. They sound like '70s club music, right? Like I yeah. said, they sound like Suicide or something. And then I'm like, wow. So I'm actually because I, I I think I do kind of sound '90s. So I'm like, wow. I'm actually less retro because I sound like <laughs> '90s. And then it, if you want to start getting and just to get a little snarky about it is sometimes I think that people are going out of their way to sound 60 years old, 70 years old. And they're even getting, they're getting the ancient amps and they're getting the vintage guitars and I'm not really dissing. I'm just saying that's what's happening. And then even with electronics, it's not, it's the opposite of the, the whole spirit of electronic music initially, which is futurist, right? Even the, the, the rap I mean, record yeah. I recorded for, with her for Hancock, um, a few, Future Shock was Future Shock. It was like electronic music as like this shocking cultural like transformation that now people are retro electronics. It's like the, it's so it's not futuristic <laughs> anymore, and they're getting um, they're and, and they're getting uh, you know vintage modular synths and vintage classic classic uh, drum machine sounds and stuff. So it's and and or worse, right? The the spaded reverb stuff that you're probably referring to from the eighties. Uh, so it's kind of retro. You're wondering where like a sense of futurism might lay in all this. And I'm, I'm not sure it is. That's why I'm saying it's kind of, it's kind of not about new sounds at the moment. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned that cause that's come up recently. Like I, I uh, I've had Jerry Casali of Devo uh, on this show a few times. And this, this last time we were talking about uh, in the eighties that, uh, that Fairlight uh since like kind of dominated like for a while much to his chagrin i might add uh but that was at the time that was like the newest possible thing uh you know later sort of taken over by uh, you know, computer emulated workstations and whatnot like that was like the highest of high tech but now you have like soft synths that are emulating <laughs> like this shitty digital i mean not shitty but a digital sampler that is like of a certain era that had like a certain uh, waveform and is kind of known for a certain era of pop music now and you have people trying to emulate that so it's like a copy of a copy of a copy and uh that's uh i mean it's, yeah, that's no, it's incredible it, it might be worth it might be worth noting just a, a potential whole other tangent here is uh that fair light that you're referring to at the, depending on the year but at least initially was was like sixty thousand dollars it's so it's expensive exactly insane <laughs> You know, so, that, so that's what I was saying about like a, a, that a reverb unit was affordable at seventeen hundred bucks in 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 nineteen eighties dollars, right? Um, uh, that's actually why uh, a lot of the early hip hop I got involved with, I kind of felt this overlapping a bit with experimental music, and and that's sure. because to get a lot of like weird sounds with a lot of hip-hop on it they liked weird sounds and a lot of effects because you, you needed effects because with hip-hop there was still like extended club versions so you'd have to have like mm -hmm. uh, unlike a lot of hip-hop now where it's like voice all the time back then there'd be like long instrumental passages so we'd have to have crazy sounds i'd listen to it it's like wow it's and all the work that went into just something having something go <laughs> right, right. Simple, i right? mean not so easy in 1984 um but i would how would I do that stuff? Because I couldn't afford a fair light and even I, an even type yeah. harmonizer, which I did have could, could do stuff like that. But it, just to manipulate that stuff, I have to get pretty fancy. I would have to like use tape. I'd have to like find some ways to put stuff on tape and then manipulate the tape, like slowing it down or speeding it up or doing a loop on the tape because I couldn't do, you know, I couldn't actually do loops with it because I couldn't afford a sampler. So I would still use the, do the aesthetics of sampling, but, find some other analog way to do it which is very tricky right so that, that's why i ended up actually doing a lot of hip-hop work because i was i'd actually spent some time in the trenches learned some of that stuff from stuff from brian eno so even work with brian eno gave me a few little studio chops that i could use in the f following years with with hip-hop well i'm thinking about like africa mambata 
<laughs> right? Like, which I'm not, if I'm not um, taken, uh, like that, one of the reasons why Sonic Youth kind of ended up working with you is is sort of like because of like the hip hop stuff and like the sort of like what was what was happening there. But like, yeah, that's all like you talk about like a blank slate, right? Like no rule book of any kind, just okay, we need to kind of make this interesting and cool and like hooky, but also there's like a, 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 it's the it's the birth of a genre. And then some of those rules that you know maybe are not even like necessarily followed kind of were being uh, created on the fly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think with Sonic Youth, by the way, coming to to me was also sort of sort of cultural. You know, it's like a, it's cultural a New York context. Thing, okay. I, yeah, I remember sure. feeling like, well, also just because it was a youth culture thing. Also, also hip hop just really had a, a ton of credibility. You know, um, in the same way, I I felt like it's funny because that's before hip hop became commercial or anyone even thought, you know, either anyone even thought that it could be like a national genre, that it could be a genre appreciated in middle America. It seemed at that point to be New York City, big cities and also maybe capital cities abroad. So there would be like an appreciation for hip hop in uh, Paris or London or even Buenos Aires right. when I went and visited Argentina. But, you know, not. But more, but not Ohio necessarily, right? Um, but, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, but, so hip hop had a lot of credibility. Yeah, so hip hop had a lot of credibility. Usually, probably because it's whenever you get young people not giving a damn what anyone thinks, and kind of doing their own thing, it's got power. And it, it similar it reminded me to what um, uh, the the hardcore scene also had a lot of credibility because it's yeah. people just just doing it, and it, and it, and they weren't be behoven, be beholded, beholding. To, to anyone and they're setting their own rules and that's always impressive and has power and everyone and this guy it has credibility and you can and then you get bands uh like like sonic youth that weren't from new york all of them except for lee ronaldo he was from new york yeah. uh but you know they weren't they weren't new york city natives you know and then it's i think um sometimes there's a positive thing can happen when people feel inadequate about their you know or, or have a little bit of uh, imposter imposter complex or something and and that's fine i found that an experiment with uh with john zorn john zorn was yeah. really trying to connect with hip with he was tried to, he tried to connect similarly he tried to connect with hip-hop and hardcore um <laughs> right. and with hip-hop in I, his way i remember yeah. he had a turntable listen the record I, I recorded with him was that i said in his way Whiz yeah which is he, on, i think it was locust yeah. like he yeah, has a very Whiz, specific Whiz way kid of, play, yeah, yeah. played on yeah, a yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So if, if everyone's every kind of looking, you know, it's it's a bit high school, but we all were a little like that. I'm not immune to that either, you know. I think. Well, no one's immune to influence, sure. And and again, I mean, I think in, in another New York band, like we we're talking about, like the mainstreamization of hip hop. I mean, like, and also coming from hardcore, the Beastie Boys, right? That first that one Beastie Boys record that like changed everything, and that that mainstreamed it in a certain way but the, uh, to, for me like i find all those early records uh super fascinating uh before like there kind of was the mainstreamization of it because people were just doing it for the love of the art and, and for the love of like just doing something cool and that's always kind of where i find my sweet spot frankly for, for my taste uh yeah uh, yeah i mean also the thing with me which i've realized over over 40 years now um because i've had to kind of really think about it it's like I, i'm just not so interested in really huge music i'm not that interested in I, i've all this time i have a clue of what's going on out there on the sort of mainstream level i do peak i do listen a little but i don't i just don't dive in i don't feel that inspiration even when i said i don't go to a lot of like big national international shows and just do local it's just like i always feel much more interested in hearing you know the band down the street that i i feel i owe a listen to because they talk to me and uh and i need to listen to that and why am i listening to amy winehouse right like, why am i giving amy winehouse the time of day when i'm not giving the time of day for people like down the block like so, so it was always that sort of logic and i was like well I, maybe i should know what amy winehouse sounds like um but that's an example it's it usually takes me maybe on the on the scale of like a decade to go and like re and go oh okay i get it maybe Maybe there's something there. Like, for instance, with Amy Winehouse, it's literally just like last month that I finally like dug back and was like, oh, you know, it's yeah, kind it's of interesting here it's and good. there. And interesting that that was main, mainstream music and it's so jazzy, you know. And, and at the time I was like, rock star. Yeah, no thanks, you know. But 
Yeah, so and, and way. And and, and a lot of times the the celebrity will sort of overtake the art a lot, and a lot of times too but i mean that was hey it's a it's there's nothing wrong with supporting like the music that's around you and being part of a community i mean if anything it's like it's i think more people should put effort into that now uh with everything attempting to be at the same time kind of siloed off but like having these experiences that are like in these little confirmation bias bubbles like the idea of like supporting something that maybe otherwise wouldn't hear uh get an audience get in hearing great i mean yeah like you know like whatever the 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 um <laughs> the uh taylor swifts of the world are gonna do just fine right i mean it's it's okay <laughs> yeah uh yeah it's uh but you know it's also difficult with uh, the way we've all gotten splintered like in a place like new york it's amazing yeah. i have to travel an hour and a half there and back to go, go to like a small DIY show. But, you know, I try to really stick it in there and go see stuff that I'm not even sure I'm going to be that into. It's if I just go anyway, you know, so it's because I should. And because I, I learned something, I learned something even from seeing what people kind of are trying to do or getting a sense of what, like a consensus almost of what a lot of people are trying to do. Even if I'm not completely down with every aspect of it, it's like, Oh, Huh, there's a pattern here. This I've I've seen like five bands in the last two months, strangely, that are going boom boom this way or that way. Suddenly it's saxophone. Huh? It's like <laughs> sax noise music or you know, just stuff like that, just because I saw one and I didn't think about it. And it's like, what's the third one in like a month? Or, you know, all kinds yeah. of so just sometimes I learn stuff like that, which I, I find interest it's just interesting, intellectually interesting to me. And um also I like considering and bringing it into into my work you know like even now i'm working on a new song and then suddenly i'm like you know no maybe it's time for me oh, never at the time i'm always late i'm always the johnny come lately and i'm like <laughs> maybe saxophone on this like noise track that would be the first time in 40 years that that happens to a piece of piece of music of my own so you know i, I anyway it's good it's all good, like a conversation you know throw in some gratuitous sax uh, yeah, I think that um, it's, it's it's notable, and it's 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 uh, and it's cool that you can kind of like see that uh, in real time too, and it's also kind of interesting to see what bands come through. Like, I think that it's it's interesting to me that there's been kind of a recent resurgence of people uh, connecting with like classic like noise rock records. Like you mentioned the Unsane earlier, right? Like something like that and and something like Evil, one of my favorite records of all time by Sonic Youth. Like people are just and it's maybe maybe those people were just there always the entire time, but they just weren't able to connect with each other, but there's a real community for like these kind of like uh you know, orphan toys. <laughs> <laughs> was it the misfit toys island of misfit toys kind of bands that like were just do completely doing their own thing and people are connecting with this music like you know in some case generations later and i think that's really special and, and very cool and you're right at the epicenter of a lot of those as far as i'm concerned yeah it's i think it's definitely not an illusion of people not being able to connect it can't be because uh take swans for instance you remember swans disbanded and then Michael Jura uh, created Angels of Light, which just took a completely different approach, um, much more folky, much more into folk. He started he started working with like uh, so called freak folk artists, right? He produced Devendra Banhart, for instance, and, and Larkin Grimm. So, um, and he even told me, you know, I, it's just really he told me that the amount of sales of like New Swans records was embarrassingly low and he couldn't get any label to do anything for him it was just so basically he was the, the pin which i have somewhere that i bought at the so-called last swan show which obviously wasn't the last swan show then it was swans are dead yeah and i meant that like that how it seemed to me that's how it seemed to him that it was just it's kind of oh so uh, I heard comments from her about like really struggling, you know, financially, for instance, yeah. uh, around that same time. So there was really just like a, also there's the sense of sometimes when things, it, it, things go, things don't only go in, in trends, but they, they, they for, work around being trendy. So, right. So, so when something's on this, on its way down, 
you know it's sort of it, it doesn't have a buzz and it might actually be able to have more of a buzz kind of later like like it, it just has a different kind of buzz because people are rediscovering something from the past and that in itself has power so for instance an individual listener particularly if they're young and they rediscover something that's empowering to them right that's that's sort of empowering them intellectually there's like i'm I'm like unveiling stuff from the past for myself or for my friends. So that's a certain power. Then the sort of thing that everyone's a little squeamish about is like, oh, I'm getting old and I'm listening to old stuff and it's getting less popular. And, you know, and, and then you kind of, everyone's, I mean, I'm like, I don't, I don't love, I don't actually love getting old. So and I, sometimes <laughs> I, I, I wonder, I mean, am I like, am I like, okay, bro, whatever. So, you know, it's, it's a th- it's a little inner dial inner voice which isn't very healthy but it's there you know so i think maybe that's a point why why when some things go, go away they they really do go down so i think somehow between grunge and then right after that the strokes you know so like you had grunge and then post grunge the mod scene in new york and you know and and those kinds of bands was- like it's it's just um there was no room there, there were like when uh, yeah, everybody kind of no really for, for like Gang of Four, for for instance, like, and they were like, "Oh yeah, Gang of Four is great, everybody." Like, here's our version of that, and like that was a weird little moment. Into, great, and it's great to like have an old audience like be exposed to that kind of music and like see what people can like do taking up with that. But like, yeah, you couldn't unless you worked at a record store. You weren't like talking about Gang of Four <laughs> before that, right? Like, this wasn't wasn't happening unless you were Flea, I guess. But you know, whatever. Yeah, and also in in. in- in its retroness, like a lot of that stuff, like strokes, um, in its retroness, it just wasn't that kind of New York that they were being retro about. These were all bands with the in the in the name, right? So it's like the strokes, and, and it was a sort of a time they were they, the, the sort of New York because they were retro, really were. They were like skinny type stuff, right? So the, the yeah. kind of and a, a bit glam, and the, not so they like they were sort of referring to punk, but it wasn't really. It was more like Max's Kansas City, not Mud Club or something. You know, it was sure, yeah, and and, and maybe just a dope CBGBs, right? So it was it's really a kind of thing. So the spotlight was really not on bands like Unsane, Swans, or whatever. And what did I do during that time? You know, during that time when that was just not on the plate anymore. Some of it's well, I, that some of that was not on the plate anymore. And I did do some mod kind of bands. You know, I did this band, The Realistics, that are in that book. You know, the um, the book uh, Meet Me in the Bathroom, right? So they're they're in the book. Um, they wish they were in the book more, but they're not. They're not. But they were in that stroke zone. I thought yeah. they were better than the Strokes, frankly. And so I went, I went kind of mod. And then even the Dresden Dolls were kind of like, I yeah. I kind of got more gothy. And I was amazed that actually, like, actually, the Dresden Dolls adored Swans. So they they were like that thread. They were part of that thread that keeps. Th- th- yeah, these things don't disappear completely. They're just not in the spotlight, but but they do disappear a little. But yeah, the so Dresden Dolls sounding nothing like Swans, is they would still say, "Oh, that's like one of our favorite bands." So, but yeah, so I did that shift. And then interesting that you brought up X Models. So I did a, a bunch of this. I was getting basically I was getting gothier by the, the year. And and I couldn't decide whether I was a goth or a mod, but whatever. <laughs> right? the two. And, uh, and then, goths are rockers. Yeah. And then and then X models calls me. X models calls me, and like I think it was a I don't even know how we communicated back. And was it an email or a voicemail or? But somehow we something. Had, who knows? Yeah. Someone in X models. <laughs> I, I believe. It was. I think it was Shaheen, or maybe it was a voice message in an answering machine, and it said, "They said to me, they go." I don't know if you've heard, but No Wave is back. And we're kind of a no wave band in Brooklyn. And we think that you'd be good to, re- it'd be good to record with you. And, um, and what was really funny is that it was a kind of a dumb message, but they're a lot smarter than that. But it was, I was I'm actually not sure. Were they like deliberately leaving a yeah, are they, are they <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Are they having a laugh? Yeah. Who knows? Right. I mean, like it's, they're smart dudes. That's for sure. I mean, like, who says that? Hey, man, I don't know if you've <laughs> heard, but No Wave is back on the horizon, and we're back. Right. We're a band from Brooklyn, and we do No Wave, so we should report with Martin B.C. I mean, that's basically what it was, is. And and the, the the strangeness of the message was kind of like, I guess so. And I was surprised because they didn't really sound like No Wave to me. They, they It was, well, it was a different kind. 
I mean, no wave is complicated. It's a bunch of different things. So it wasn't yeah. the no wave I was imagining them saying. But yeah, it was it, it was kind of like no wave mis you know what it was? X miles no wave mixed with like in um industrial, like heavy pounding, uh very um yeah, very with <laughs> industrial with those kinds of qualities, distorted drums. Kind of closer like, to you said it perfectly. I should just pull what you just did. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's yeah, that most exactly. like, brutality. <laughs> That's, that's not extended. X models was all like thirty second songs. Yeah, it, it's which they carried over from their earlier Hog record. To me. Yeah. Someone in Boss Hog. Oh, they carried that over from their earlier record because their earlier someone record in was, Boss Hog. It was oh, their earlier record was succinct as well. Um, we got a little bit of a delay. Maybe, the earlier maybe. record was was different sounding, but it was very succinct as well. That's what the corollary is that it was even though that was more I guess like kind of weird pop oriented and kind of angular, almost shellac style in some parts, shellac plus talking heads or something, but it was still right. very brief, brief, brief and quick. And what they did is they kind of gravitated more to, towards what I would say is like more of like a swans throbbing crystal kind of thing. But like they kept the succinctness of the songs, which I thought was fascinating. That's but yeah. It's it. funny. Cause I, uh, <laughs> just a, a comment that a comment that boss, someone in boss hog, Jens, the bass player of, of boss hog, uh, said to me while we were watching X models, he said it was all exclamation points, <laughs> which I thought was kind of cool. And I don't think it was a diss. I don't no, think it was a diss. But I said it was interesting, and I was like, "That's awesome. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's all accurate. exclamation points. No, nope. <laughs> no commas. Yeah, that's a." Uh... That's a that's a fantastic piece of uh, <laughs> piece of like I don't even know if it's criticism. It's, it's just like a no, like a notation. That's great. <laughs> but I think it's it's wild too that like there was yeah. a uh, there, because there were a lot of bands like and of course yeah 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 bro broke big too. But I still remember the seconds too. Like what who I I uh, arguably liked liked a little better. And of course if you if you want to have a recipe for not success, cater to Kona Neutron. That's that's what I always say. Uh but the uh, there was a lot of bands that were just doing inventive and cool things at that time. And some of them were started hitting big, but not all of not all of them did. But I think there came a deeper appreciation of that sort of early eighties and like whether, you know, I, I, again, I used to work at a record store, so I don't want to get into what or does, does and does not construe no wave because that is like one of the most academic and boring discussions ever, but there was a deep appreciation of that music and like maybe the potential that you can do with that and how you could apply it in, in, in your own use. And it was great to see people doing like reappraising things like Lydia lunch, for instance, who was kind of off in the wilderness as far as like being an influence for a while. And then it kind of came back like, oh, my God, Lydia Lunch is awesome. It's like, yeah, where were you? Of course, <laughs> of course, Lydia Lunch is awesome. She's like was born uh, to like screw things up in the world. And she does a fantastic job of it. And she's, she's a force of nature. Uh, so, again, with all that. Ha taking that into like a modern construct and like, i mean do you do you see that i mean for you it seems like it might even just be water right you've been with it the entire time but stuff comes and goes and there's people rediscover things and i think if the internet's good for anything it's people can discover older stuff and uh connect with it like decades later in a way that maybe it didn't connect to when it was around so you you, you had a question in there and i kind of that can you what's I, the I, question I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to deal with the delay, so I'm th I'm this it's like I'm throwing things out like I'm a basque out or something here. But yeah, <laughs> but like I mean, when you see bands like coming in, like listening to those little old records and bringing something like new to it, uh, like is it is it something where, like, do you hear where they're coming from, or, or is it is it something where you're just taking on the face of what it is, their creativity, what they're doing, what they're writing at that moment in time, or do you see it more as a through line with uh, like uh, these earlier records and things that you've done before this lifetime of not only, uh, you know, recording your own music, but like being around all this music that was groundbreaking, but not commercially successful <laughs> necessarily at that, all the time. Yeah. It, it's funny because I, I, I slowly started seeing uh, movements, for instance, in, in like an, as an arc, as a continual a continuing arc that sort of evolves. And it's funny because years and years ago, I was talking to someone um, about um, Arabic music or I forget what it was like, Arab, Arabic jazz or something like that. And I kind of was saying, well, I'm not that interested in doing traditional music. And I use the word traditional, right? But then the person sort of corrected me and said, well, you know, it, it might be traditional in a way or refers to that or sounds that way to you, but there really is, it has its own legs and its own way of developing. 
And um, I, I, I didn't really buy that then, but actually now that I'm having to look at um, the reality that I'm making music personally and working with people where the, it really it's very clearly comes and refers to stuff that's old, that's 40 years old. And I was just, just a few minutes ago complaining about everything being retro right now. But yet on the other hand, I do know that there are these references sort of inescapable. I mean, who, who can who can invent rock and roll, right? You're like, I didn't invent it. You didn't invent it. None of us could invent it or would if it would have been able to. So it's like you're always referring to something. So there's a point of like, well, what, so you end up splitting hairs. But what I started realizing is that some of these things um, have um, a real arc to them. So, so I've actually started like almost misspeaking. Sometimes I slip and I refer to I refer to myself in 1978 and I will say this scene as talking about this one that I'm in now. So for instance, it, it, it came up in conversation the other day where I said, I've been in this scene since 1978. So, you know, I, if I think that some things have changed hardly, because I think actually it's true that some things are hardly changed. Um, then, you know, I, I think that, that that matters or something like that. I was making some sort of point, but then I realized I was actually referring to, I was ref talking, the people I was talking to who were a lot younger, I was basically saying, I've been in this scene, the same, the same scene that you young people are in now. I've been in it since 1968. And I, I, I haven't been, I didn't like construct that in my brain, you know, very clearly. It's just that that's how I see it. I do see it as a bit of a continuum. And, um, uh, it's uh, I feel like it's, it's it's a mystery why some people kind of come and go in it. And there's a surprising number of people that seem to have disappeared and go away. And then you realize, oh, they're back some new band that they're doing. Right. And they're sort yeah. of back in because they because everyone go, goes on. Everyone goes on little tangents. Right. So you had like Michael Jarrah suddenly doing folk music, you know, and then, oh, now he's back. Right. right. And so now it's like part of that scene again. So it's um, so I think that there's a there's a, a continuum and there's a. Um, I think it's a mix of things. There has to be some freaking innovation, right? So for me, um, some innovation. I'm not even that crazy. I'm not that uh, draconian about that because I, I know that there's – I'm not even trying to say that anything can be purely original or going, well, this is not original. That is original. This, it's kind of no no way, right? So I'm, I'm yeah. pretty happy. I mean yeah. in, as much innovation as possible, really, but I'm happy with kind of – some innovation because I know how difficult it is. So I, I am expecting things to evolve and I am expecting people to bring new, th new things to the table. Um, so when I work with bands, all mo mostly for them, for the most part, younger than me, um, or at least bands might have at least some younger people, I hope. Um, <laughs> then, you know, and I'll sort of, I become a bit of a filter because I'm not an unbiased. I'm not like Steve Albini, an unbiased uh, engineer. I definitely have some biases and, and that's okay. I mean, it's all transparent when I'm working with a band, I'll, we talk about it and I'll, Oh, by the way, I'm letting you know, I'm trying to make, who knows? I'm trying to make the drum sound a little drivier, or I'm thinking maybe more of this, a little more of a industrially kind of thing. So sometimes I talk about that stuff, you know, so I'm, I'm talking about what I'm trying to bring out of things or, you know, or I'm like, you know, I, I don't know. I, sometimes I I don't think I use the word dated too much, like a, a maybe an effect or an approach, you know. But I'll be I'll maybe I'll suggest I don't know. It's I hear a lot of stuff like that. Maybe is what I'll say. I feel like doing maybe something different, and people are like, you know, because there's a lot of room in records. It's funny. That's why you need. That's why you can benefit from working with someone like me. I think is that um, a band sometimes can only take things so far because they can talk, they can rehearse, they can get the sounds on the amps. They and talk about records that I also like them to talk that talk about that with around like being around hearing a band communicate and learning from like what they're that's why I try to go see bands several times at shows that pick up on what they're trying to do and how they're talking about doing it and then it's still you got to make that jump into recording a record you know and even if they've recorded one or two records it's like well what is signature about this that Really, you got to stick to that's the essence of the band and what stuff is like open to maybe some changes that might be welcome that the band might like. So, yeah, as far as new ideas and innovation that that, that thing bring things out from like different genres and stuff, 
um, yeah, I think that that's kind of crucial, but I still think of things as being in some sort of continuum. There's some foundational right. like values in the sounds and in the even talking about even using the word experimental in any kind of way. That's already kind of a niche where you're taking experimentalism as in a in a lowercase e, right, and applying it to things. Um, you know, if you talk to John Spencer, he knows John Zorn. I think I've been to a John Zorn, Zorn course, show yeah. with Spencer. So it's, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm sure. it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but you know, so yes. because, and that's and that's you know, I remember clearly uh, Spencer at a, at a Glenn Branca show. So that that's that's yeah, experimental. Yeah. You know, even though he would never say he's experimental, we're all uh, yeah. So there's like there are these uh, sort of satellite scenes, right? Adjacent scenes, you know, like is prog metal. metal is prog metal right. sort of adjacent to my like industrial no wave, you know, like <laughs> maybe a little, right? Well, and like, I'm thinking about, you know, and we've mentioned before, like the unsane, like that, that, that unsane record, like there, there, it wasn't, what was it? It was heavy. It's not metal. Like, what is it exactly? It's well, it's insane is what it is. <laughs> like, and, and that is now, now people kind of retcon it into being like, Oh, it's, you know, whatever. It's like, you know, <laughs> noise rock. Okay, cool. Fine. But if the, you know, it's, that's for to be defined later. It's, it just seems like these, there's some fellas from, from New York making a hell of a racket. That is, is totally awesome. I mean, like a, a killer record. Yeah. The, the, the whole, def the whole defining of genres. I mean, it's gotta happen. I, I, you know, it's funny is I'm not really against, but the talk that goes around music, you know, well, actually here, here we are talking about music. I'm not really, because there's always been that, right? I mean, records would put that records used to have liner notes that were written by a journalist and it'd be back, bam, on the back of the record. Here's what I was about to say is um, everyone's uncomfortable with, with, with the labeling, but you know what? It's someone's job. Like that's, that's not my job. I'm not actually good at that, but, but um, I take it. Robert Criscow, the, the critic, right? He's come up with some, pretty good uh, genre names, right? So he came up with Scrock for describing a certain kind of experimental music. Which is and great. Then when, great as, as, yeah. And then when, and then, That's well, here's good. another one. I don't know if you noticed this one, but when, 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 um, and um, as, as the X models put it to me, no wave was back. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Gow, somewhere in there, referred to a genre that sort of like Lydia Lunch style mm -hmm. and referred to it as pick fuck. So <laughs> I do, yes, I do good. remember I mean, that. That's, yeah, that's, that's creative. That's evocative. <laughs> that's kind of like poetry. It's like, I'm not, I'm not a poet. So I'll leave the genre calling for someone else. And if unsane is noise rock, it, it, cause it's relative. It's like, what's, what yeah. is noise rock about unsane? Is that the focus is maybe on a sort of, it basically, you know what it is? It, it's noise rock because relative to other things, that's a salient characteristic and, and it might have to do less with what insane is doing now, but relative to like what's out there and, and around. Right. And at the yeah. time, unsane did not seem that noisy compared to like, like other stuff happening at that time that people were talking about. So maybe live stall or something, you know, so it's, it's, it's also, yeah, it's, against, <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's against other yeah. things. Yeah. It's all in context, and it, it's. But I think that uh, it's it, it's interesting to see how people sort of redefine things later on and, and take influence from. It. I mean, like like it, I it was weird to me in a cool way that about I don't know about ten years ago I started noticing bands were like, oh, you guys, do you guys like Carp? Do you guys like Unsane? I was like, oh yeah, they're you know favorite bands. Oh, oh okay, cool. Like I'm like, yeah, you nobody would know those those. <laughs> those bands when like I was growing up except for like you know weirdos like me and it was, it was just kind of interesting that they were and they were and they're referring to them as if it were they were on the same level as like smashing pumpkins or something where it's like no I assure you that was not the case like there's that, that was not the case at all uh but they they were taking influence from them and doing their own thing with it and it was really cool to see because I think that's a good application of like the internet and, and like having the ability to immediately find this music that maybe this heat, that's a great example, right? People like rediscovered like this heat, uh, the band Death from Detroit, things along. Th there's plenty of stories along along those lines. But but I think uh, coming back to the original subject, if there's a good document of it, whether it's, you know, Mike in a room or whether it's like a more produced affair, then it has the ability to connect with the audience, even if that audience is like years later, like decades later. And I think that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing with music. And it's been neat to see so many of these records like connect with people 
uh, again, like perfect example, the Unsane record. They, 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 so like people just like discovering it, like how kids every year discover that minor threat record. <laughs> you know, some 15 year old boy discovers that minor threat record every year. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I mean, also, here's the thing is that there's um, <laughs> it's here's part the of this thing is that is that rock. I'm so I'm sorry. I kind of cut you off, Conan. No, no, I was just saying, and, and it's, I mean, you're a part of history. Oh, I was gonna say, that's what I'm saying. That's, 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 please go ahead. Sorry, I'm, this delay is killing me. So I have, my, my apologies. I have tends to natter on. So I'll, I'll let you go. Please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All good. Um, yeah. Also, it's, 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 uh, you know, rock is remarkably not popular right now, right? So rock, yeah. you know, like in, in terms of, I'm sorry, in the main. Stream. I should not say it's not popular. It's pop rock everywhere. Every freaking town has a punk house. Every every college town, Main Street has like rock venues. So it's mm -hmm. it's. I, I shouldn't say it's not popular. I miss both, but it's definitely not um, in the top forty, and it's not in com on commercial radio. And uh, you're not. Um, you don't have like in the so called independent rock and weird rock competing with like corporate rock that those days are gone so really the the whole world has come down to and, and people like people like finding things to look up to and, and to be touchstones i think it helps help some of these young people communicate when they're like talking about the same band that you know so i think it's kind of helped a lot of these uh like minor threat has helped that there is that all there is in terms of big rock is a uh, greed event fleet or something you know so <laughs> Um, yeah, totally. totally. So they're not yeah. being. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it it connects in a way that is it, it has a deeper meaning, um, and especially when it's uh, folks of a younger age, especially like it's it, it can connect in a very deeper way, even though it's maybe doesn't have the same context as when th those records were made like years ago. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to have that context, and it's it's still relevant culturally. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Let's also just point that. Um... Because this is one thing that's all confused confused me over the years that there would be genres like even in art in art movements genres that were thought of as being oil and water like pop art and abstract expressionism that no way would those people even even share a a, a smoke or a drink or a bar or it's like oil and water mods versus the rockers right and then you go, come back and you know 15 15 years 20 30 40 years later people are appreciating pop art and abstract expressionism in one thing and it's it's yeah so there's um uh you know cognitive dissonance there you know so for instance like between metal and um and punk how that that all came to together how it's there's like a high it's hybridized and then I remember seeing a band called sex slaves during the mod era like in the around 2000 and it, I was always like mystified because they would they played some covers and they, they they really had fancy gear like fancy gear with weird <laughs> like um weird hardware for the drums like really expensive shit and then they would play some metal then they would play like ramones and i was like wow that's funny because ramones really 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 had a different set of values right um they would have like one tom one cymbal and there would be clearly like duct tape on the drums and right, it was all yeah. about a sort of like underproduced you know ec they were like famously economical so the idea of it being played in this sort of like showcasey thing to like a sort of a mod strokesy new york like looking back was kind of like wow they're taking some of the it's because these because genres and subgenres are their own little like social movements so they have their values and those sort of like dissipate a little bit so now that's why you can have like kids Maybe listening a little bit about maybe listening a little out of context, but I don't think it's that's so bad because you no. know you needed people to establish certain like like aesthetics, but you can mix that up. You can be a little more produced and have more expensive equipment and still be have like a raw vibe like the Ramones or something. It's not completely they're really it, it was it seemed like oil and water then. Doesn't seem that way now and really never really quite was oil and water. Yeah, and I think that that's I, well, some people I think have a hard time accepting that there's context other than theirs too. And not just in music, just in life. But I think that that's uh, maybe one of the problems. I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's usually great. I'm I, I kind of side eye this sort of uh, retconning of new metal being normalized. I'm sort of like, really that stuff. Okay. But uh, you know, whatever that's neither here. Nor. That's a separate discussion. Not one that I'm super interested in getting into. I, I would love to, for you to talk about uh, well, Lydia lunch in general, but death Valley 69, I think is like one of the all time, 
songs. Like, I think that's such a cool song. Like, I, I think it, it make, always makes those lists of, like, you know, <laughs> best songs about murderers or, or murders or whatever. Like, those kinds of, like, listicles that show up now and again. And uh, as much I love Sonic Youth and as I love uh, Lydia Lunch, I'm, I'm always blown away by that composition. So can you tell me what it was like, like, when you did, like, was it brought in as a demo? Like, how, how did the process for, for making that um, uh, come to pass? And if you want to expand a little bit about the wonderful Lydia Lunch or Sonic Youth, please go right ahead. I, I... Yeah, I think um, I, a lot, some of that came together in the studio. So I remember, like, Thurston and... Um, and Lydia working on the like the middle break. You rang of uh, no 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 or you know so there was um uh so there was uh I forget if they did it together or not together, but they were kind of writing that in the studio then. Surely they rehearsed a little bit, you know. There um th that was also a time before I started even thinking or bands like that would even think they wanted. A producer. There was a, that. This was before the, the sense of there being a, a producer, right? Um, and a lot of a lot of bands never even ultimately ever wanted a producer. But that 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 wasn't that much of a discussion then because none, none of this stuff was successful. I mean, none of this stuff like uh, Bad Moon Rising was self financed. Basically, they got a loan from friends, right? So um, you know, there was no sense of a producer. There was also studio time was expensive. I was, I charged more then than I do now. Um, so, you know, <laughs> bands would tend to come in surprisingly more prepared. Right. Um, ba bands came in more prepared then now. And, and you, you don't want to get me started there because I've actually started wondering if w with the crazy economics, if my studio time is actually cheaper than rehearsal time because it's funny sometimes i have people come in the studio like oh wow they're like well you know we have to like actually work on the song a little more and i'm like oh, yeah, we need to arrange it <laughs> they didn't really rehearse that song and i'm wondering oh am i yeah. am i doing everyone a favor maybe i should up my maybe i should up the rate so that it'll force people to come in more rehearsed so people so they came in wow. sonic youth was pretty rehearsed when they came in you know so i didn't i didn't i wasn't privy to to the like how they arranged it and stuff, you know, but I do remember that lyrically Lydia and, um, and Thurston were working on stuff. And also like, um, how did I come upon Lydia? Like, I think, I think, well, Sonic Youth came on to me, right. They contacted me and then it felt like I had a connection with Lydia because, um, my ex-wife was pals with her and, and then I was pals with JG Thurwell, and then uh, Lydia and Thurwell were, were were partners. So I was like, oh, but because it was a thing that it, it confusing because I felt like, oh, I already know Lydia, but I kind of don't, or not yet. And um, so you know, there was a big a social dimension there that's kind of I'm getting pretty hazy on. Um, the one thing that's kind of funny is all the mixing then was um, the mixing itself felt. You know what's funny. It felt experimental. What does that mean? Why would I even say it's experimental? Well, it felt experimental because it was spontaneous. Uh, it was, there was a lot of spontaneity in the mixes. So we would do um, three, four mixes. And there was usually a thing of like, well, do we just do these? And with a rough idea of what the levels would be, like a rough idea. So it'd be like <laughs> a little mark with the grease pencil. It's like, okay. And then have a rough idea of what the, how the levels change. Okay, here maybe we should bring up a snare drum. Right. And then, you know, and then sometimes we would have a thing where like the person who played the instrument can't be the person with the finger on that on that fader. Right. So the drummer can't have the snare fader and the guitar player can't have the guitar fader. And uh, so we would. And so sometimes these things of levels were just sort of like done on the fly. And then what happens? Oh, that's great. Except we didn't like a section, the mix. What do we do? Do we just like do do take edit from different pieces of different mixes? Um, oh, there was all kinds of weird things. Or we, I remember there was some Sonic Youth song where it was like, like for some reason it was like roll tape, and I didn't know where. And then I would just roll the half inch tape, tape, and then I just pressed record. And then by mir the, you know the, the the mastering, the two track tape, the stereo tape. So then by some miracle, I just pressed record. In which case, then it switches to the other multi-track tape that's rolling and by oh, miracle cool. it just lined up the stuff you hear about with Beatles, right? This is stuff you yeah. hear about on like on like Sgt. Pepper or something where it's like 
it like lined up in some place and suddenly made this weird like maybe soundscape thing like one third longer because of where I hit it and then it would combine the two like it was an edit and it was like whoa I don't know it was like who the hell knows how that happened so there was some of that with Death Valley 69 and a good example of that it cracks me up every time at the end of the song like in the last got to be one second one second and a half maybe one second you hear the guitar fader a guitar fader just and just push yeah. all the way to fucking max so what what the hell happened so i think someone not naming names just just <laughs> reached over and just like shoved the fader in the last two seconds that's that's hilarious <laughs> i was wondering about that yeah <laughs> it, that move informs what the whole vibe of the song really should be in terms of guitar like couldn't have that guitar level the whole time like no, like no you could, yeah. you, that that guitar level was like twice as there would be no drums right so you right. can't have that but in that hot one second it gave you the sense of like gives you the sense of what if the guitar was just way the fuck over the top like overwhelmingly <laughs> over the top that like almost like that's the final statement of Imagine the whole song with that level of the last where it's just like ear splitting for like a hot second. You're possible to listen to, but like so there's that's kind of what I remember about the yeah. song. <laughs> there's, there's no way you wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't be able to even like handle it. It's too much. Uh, but it, as as like just like a yeah, like a cat, you know, it's perfect. Like that's it's absolutely perfect. <laughs> uh yeah, and I mean it's such a singular composition. I I love that Bad Moon Rising record. It's been a long time. I had Bob on the show, Bobbert, and um he was he was very cool of him to share his experiences of of that and uh, and that era of Sonic Youth. Personally, for my taste, Evil's the one, man. That's that's the Sonic Youth record that um I come back to the most that I've listened to the most over the years. Uh I it's absolutely one of my favorites. And uh, you know, I'm not going to let you get away without talking about it because of that. So, uh, yeah, what, what can you tell me about evil? I mean, it's, it's, I, first of all, I, I love that. <laughs> is it Madonna Sean me? Is it expressway to your skull? Is it, is it uh crucifixion of Sean Penn? It's all of those things and more. I love that. They just never like, yeah, whatever. It's all of those things. It's, but it's like one of my favorite songs. It's it's such a, such a, such a cool song. And that's in Sonic youth at that time period. Um, I think it's such a hot run for them. Uh, so what can you tell me about in together evil and, and the band at that time, uh, post expressway or not uh, post uh, death Valley. Sorry. Well, uh, um, right. yeah, well, it was kind of funny because, um, um, you know, like I, I never solicit artists. Like I rarely one, you know, I, I rarely actually tell them I'd like to record with them. I, I usually just slip it in. I, I flirt kind of, you know, I just, <laughs> Show up and meet them, throw in a few compliments, you know, yeah. and I enjoy talking about, I, I try, I enjoy, no matter what, I enjoy getting in the weeds. So I like to tell people maybe I, I, some of the songs were faster this time. I kind of like that or, you know, I never say anything negative. So, you know, um, so I never do, do, and I never solicit bands or even if, or even try to get bands to come back to me, you know, people got to make their own choices and I just don't like going there. And so, um. I um but that but an a um an exception was Sonic Youth after um after um Bad Moon Rising. And I remember what it was is I felt like I um I felt a little uneasy about having been as proactive as I had been with uh Bad Moon Rising. Like I felt like I you know, just had it my way a bunch of times and, you know, imposed my view be a little much. I thought I was, I was a little uneasy. Maybe I had, maybe I'd been, I could think of a few moments, you know, people aren't perfect. So maybe a couple times I was a little hard headed. Was I, I think maybe, maybe I was. So I, I felt a little weird about that. So it's funny. Cause I, uh, I saw, um, actually I, I, uh, uh, I was in the, in Chinatown and I, on uh, a spur of the moment decided to call Kim because I real Kim Gordon, because I realized I was two blocks from her and Thurston's house. So I was just like, hey, I'm outside. And so um, that's how people did things back then. You wouldn't do that now. But I was like, oh, I don't know. What you doing? And so so she had me up. And then I, I told her, you know, I'm sorry if I did that. And uh, uh, she was she said she was impressed. She was like, wow, it's really impressive that you would 
you know, be forthcoming about that. And then I think um, like two weeks later, I ran into Thurston at a, at a show. I can't remember if it, we could. He's super tall, so I was like, I was down here, and Thurston yeah. was up there, and I think, I, yeah, I, I think it was. I think it was. I don't even know if he heard me. I was like, I think I'd like to record with you guys again or something. And uh, so it so, but then what was actually sort of funny is I actually. And I was aware of it. I, I'm like, oh my god, what is this? I'm like, I realized I was even being more in evil, imposing a viewpoint or whatever. And I, I, I just, and I, I felt weird about it again. But, but here's the thing: is they didn't push back. Um, uh, even Th Thurston would kind of say, uh, "Okay, she says sounds too good," <laughs> and uh, or sounds good, maybe too good. So it was something ambiguous. It was maybe it was the more ambiguous version of that comment. And I remember thinking, well, is that something we should talk about? Or maybe, or maybe I'll keep that in mind. Okay, maybe, all right, I got it. Maybe not too good. Let's, or something like that. But I remember I was also riffing off records that they would play me, right? So, because um, mm -hmm. I also, I do like that. I like people playing, playing the influences. I like, I, I just want to hear, I, I like hearing through my ears, but I also like be, knowing how things sound through other people's ears. So yeah. I like hearing what they're listening to. And like, um, they, they, so Sonic Youth was playing Jesus and Mary Chain, like at the studio and like breaks or something, or talking about, oh, did, amongst themselves, oh, you're the new Jesus and Mary Chain. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should listen to this, you know? And I think that, that I was starting to be exposed to um, more to like 80s, 80s sort of productions, you know, and like at that time of Evil. And I think... It, it between um there's something about um about uh bad moon rising that feels kind of urban to me it feels like a, it's a, a different era it's almost more of like it's a little more like late 70s even um and it, it's got a little it's it's and and somehow evil was sonic youth is a part of the 80s you know and and yeah, uh, yeah. I, it might not even sound that way now but but at the time to my ear, that's kind of what was happening. But but you know what's funny is that 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 might sound like an attempted sellout, but it really wasn't. We, I I just no. I, I always think <laughs> yeah, like, not at all. Like, what? How do you make? How do you like? Like how do I make a band sound like it's in the now? I, like I, like I said about half an hour ago, I was saying you know we all want to be cool a little bit, and I and so, so there's a part of me that so to what point do you want to make a band and an artist sound? a bigger picture that's kind of cool and a conversation that's cool and at what point do you want to like cut off and be like yeah you know we don't do that anymore or like you know so you, i make those kinds of weird little choices because i think and this is what's interesting about sound than record making is that it doesn't take much it's like little clues little cues in sounds of like does it belong in this category or that category is it more or this or that like subgenres and there's these little issues you know so um, there was something that that there was something exciting in the air, and there was a new era. And somehow, in my mind, I felt like with Sonic with Evil that I wanted to be part of that new era with that record and and break a, away a little bit from the, what I thought was a more urban sound that you could read in New York City sound. And here I am because they were playing playing me a British band, Jesus and Mary Chain, and then that sort of stuck whereas with with bad moon rising they were like talking about hip-hop and africa bambata and stuff you know yeah. so i think that that's sonically what and and i liked it too because there was something about the 80s that also allowed a lot more experimentation with processing and stuff so you could again still like inventing the wheel as we go it wasn't late 80s it was earth it was at the cusp it was at the beginning of yeah what would end up yeah. Have it happening in the 80s which eventually was kind of well, eventually, the 80s went to, to a place of a lot of excess with process and effects. But this was just at the, at the beginning of that. So so this was – so that's kind of how I felt about about Evil. And um, uh, I remember there being a lot of overdubs. Lee Renal has stated that there were hardly any overdubs. So I don't even know. That shows to what extent you can remember about things. You can remember right. things. But, you know, there is that interesting um, – song um in the kingdom in the kingdom 19 or in the kingdom 19, yeah. in the kingdom something or other right yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah that that song and th this has been talked about it's it's in some sonic youth bios biographies and stuff is uh well that's the the rare song that was uh lee ronaldo singing right because lee was lee sings one song on every sonic youth record 
So um, that's a friend, and Mike Watt was there, you know, and that had had that had the weird moment, which has been told a million times, which is that the the firecrackers thrown into the vocal booth by Thurston while Lee was singing, and right. like Lee screaming when you saw the firecrackers and then like the firecrackers like exploding and you can hear it on the song and the vocal booth filled up with white smoke um and then no one was talking to each other and then lee's like okay whatever but he marches back to the thing marches back to the vocal booth and i kind of listen back and i'm like oh wow that's kind of cool there's a hey what's not to <laughs> like there's like a scream a blood curdling scream talk about yeah, us, yeah. right and then there's like some fucking explosion <laughs> what's not to like and so i'm like like not even not making it a big comment. I was like, "Hey, fellas, what do you think? What if I punch after that?" And then Lee, I was like, "Yeah, fine, right." <laughs> That's amazing. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> punch, punch whatever, punch me whatever you want to punch. He it, it, it was still a little upset. So then you yeah. hear that in the song, and then it right, punches right. at the end. And then there's the explosion, and then it picks up again, totally calm. Um, and that, so so that it was funny because that is. Similar to on on uh, Death Valley '69, where someone, I think possibly Lee, just reached over the console and shoved the guitar fader all the way to the top in the last yeah. second of the song. So that's a bit of a, a corollary. And also, Mike Watt speaks at the end of of In the Kingdom number whatever it is. I'm sorry, and uh, I think he speaks and someone. I think it's pretty pretty sure it's Thurston that says, "I never thought about the meter man. I never thought about the meter man." Until I had to read the meters, man. Right, that sets in the song. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's so that was that's in, you, you know I, I think that um I think and I still think this every record because I still believe in like a bell. I, I, that's what I didn't like about the, the the Napster era, right? The download era was the people saying maybe yeah. the single. You know, what that meant in weird ways, people stopped caring about albums. And that was very depressing, actually, for me. That was like, oh, no. It was, like, all about, like, download. Like, because people wouldn't download a whole record. they download a song at a time or two songs. So it was like the single is back. But anyway, now that the album is back, thank thankfully, I still feel like, like um, each record should have one song, two songs. Like, 20% of the record, 15 20% of the record should be maybe constructed in the studio somewhat. So it gives the studio... <laughs> Like it's an environment and a, a, a story of the band at that, that time, and then of course the rest of it. Actually, I like I like the rest of the record being kind of prepared and people being prepared before they come and well rehearsed. I, ideally, the band coming right off tour, and that the material's already been live. Yeah. Well, so when when really there's already that, that tightness so, from, I do uh, believe. You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's there's nothing like that. And so and and then tempo tempo. Tempo or ironed out. I mean, I, I do I do think that that's important, you know. And then I can worry about traditional things like sounds and stuff, you know. Um, but yeah. I think there's something about it in the studio. And then the, these weirdo, like the weirdo songs, right? The album tracks that are, aren't necessarily going to be the big favorites for people, but they're the weirder songs with a bit more interesting story. And maybe I can be a little more involved in those. They're more of like stu, but more like done in the studio a bit or. And 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 that gives the, the record a bit of life and reality and and spread. And also, here's the thing in the in the discussion is it comes up every era is should the recording sound to present the band live? And I even myself as a producer and engineer have swung before from like oh yes absolutely to like no, it doesn't need to represent the band live. Then now I got to say I'm in the no camp on that because. Um, I can see the experience, right? The, the people buy records, it seems to me, at the merch table, right? So why buy a record if it's going to sound just like the band live? Yeah, um, what's the point? And you probably already <laughs> like recorded the band on your cell phone. <laughs> right, so yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. interest, the I value, <laughs> the value is that you're going to buy a record and it's going to represent what can this artist do in the studio when they can like stretch out and have maybe some interesting new idea stuff that wouldn't be right for the, for the live set. That's what you want in there. So that's why sometimes even in the studio, I don't like, I don't like showcasing the studio too much with like, like too many fun effects, but every once in a while, I'm like a little bit is good because it reminds people that they're listening to something constructed in the studio because that there's something to be said for that because it's, it's not live and you're not, not going to hear it again. And it's just that the experience, it's a different experience. And it's, it's also, the, it's not, 
uh, it's not alienated. It's like a, the a, the recording experience is a place in time. It's in Gowanus, Brooklyn, and it's in a certain year. And it also represents things that were happening in those people's lives then, right? So you can, you are capturing something that's a, a chemistry that maybe won't be in the live set and is unique to the recording. So that's good. I cut, so a couple of things. Uh, I'm a very interested in in hearing how the honeymoon and ride record came out that um the lydia lunch with um you know it was a nick harvey in the cave and uh roland s howard and i know it kind of has a whole storied history with it i talked about it a little bit uh with mick harvey when, when he was on but i'd be interested in your take on it like putting all that together and uh that kind of just weird bizarre i mean there's that some velvet morning cover that's like I would not have expected a Lee Hazelwood and Nancy Sinatra cover, but here we are. And I'm here for it. It's awesome. Uh, it's a cool record. And it's kind of like a weird kind of like one off amongst like all those uh, various folks, very storied catalog. And do you remember anything about it that you could, you could share with us in the audience? Um, well, there's two, I get confused. I get confused and mix things together. And I really mix things together with people I work with a lot. So I was doing a lot of work with Jim Thurwell. Was this a record that was mixed by Jim Thurwell and me? Well, I think uh, he did. I think okay. So Thurwell did a mix session on it, I guess, in '87. But this is like uh, like the sessions are from back like '82 or something. I guess it's like a little older. Yeah, oh, yeah, '82. Yep. Um, maybe this is why it's been in yeah, secret. So no one can remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, there was that's another the, record around that same time, and what was that one called? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um. There was another record called Shotgun Wedding. Shotgun Wedding. Called That's Shotgun right. Wedding that involved. So I'm getting the two mixed up together. And, and I know Jim Thurwell, at, at, because Jim Thurwell was Lydia's partner back then. And I think with Honeymoon and Red, did, 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 did the Australians, I think that they weren't happy with the mixing. Yeah, is, there was some is, like. Is, and, and I'm not. I, yeah, there was some contentiousness about it, uh, for for sure. Is my understanding they not a lot being discussed, but uh, yeah, like there was some sort of fallout about that. I I don't know exactly what it was, but it was uh, it's just a very it's a very interesting, weird little uh, weird record, and <laughs> again, that some velvet morning yeah, covered thing, the, and um, you know. Amazing. <laughs> Here, here's the thing generally that I'm surprised that people don't think think about, right? Um, I've seen it happen with Jim Thurwell, and I've seen it happen with Michael Jara. Is when you get someone to mix your record or an engineer your record, it's going to sound like one of a handful of ways that they do things. If you work with me, you know, I, I really, really try, I try to avoid this, and it's absolutely not my way of the it's not my way or the highway, and I, I definitely do not have I, – I don't want to have a one unique sound. I know it's not endless, I know, but the reality is, is maybe I have five unique sounds, and but, but it's not one. It's like five, but still, you're going to sound like something like that. So what I recommend to people when they're going to pick an engineer or a producer is like just listen to what they've done because it's going to – you're going that's how you're going to sound you're going to like one one of those kinds of records that that person's worked on that's how you're going to sound if you pick them that's not so people like for instance um that band uh us maple from yes. um yes. you know that was on drag well. city yep. and yeah 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 that so that record for instance michael jara produced you know and uh they they love the swans so they said well let's get michael jara but did they really listen to swans records did they really listen to michael jara's productions of his own records because that's how Michael Jarrah was going to make them sound. And that was, those were records. With, that was a record. The talker was the record with um, us maple where they were like, yeah. Talker, yeah. Michael's way didn't work for them. So here's the thing is, is Jim Thurwell has a very specific sound. Um, and I, I, I think that ultimately, ultimately people are like, we love Jim Thurwell sound. So maybe something great can happen if, if Jim, uh, uh, and with Jim's way um, is superimposed on this music, but then the reality is, is I think it wasn't right for them. But that happens. Like, and also Jim, his style, Jim Thurwell, JG, was um, like uh, around that time he started also doing remixes, which is something I never was into doing. Um, I would help 
Jim Jim Thurwell do remixes, but I personally didn't like doing that because I I didn't like transforming bands. I never was into transforming bands. I was into like focusing, adjusting. You know, not trans, yeah, not hundred eighty yeah. degrees different. So, for instance, I actually helped Jim Thurwell doing a remix of a Sonic Youth song, um, "White Cross," um, and oh, yeah. uh, which from a later record. And it was mm-hmm. not new, and 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 the remix was not used. It never came out. It's sitting. It's sitting on my shelf here somewhere, actually. Oh, <laughs> I, okay. I saw it the other day. Um, it just never did because because it was like I know y'all love Jim Thurwell, but guess what? It's going to sound like Fetus. So it sounded like <laughs> Fetus, and yeah. I think that the same thing is my guess. I guess is what happened with Honeymoon in Red and all that, and it was like Jim Thurwell's big, big thumbprint. And my gut feeling is that it was probably good. In fact, I'm sure it was good because I was there and was happy working on it with Jim. So I'm sure it was good. But ultimately, it's his baby, right? He was the person doing it. So I was the engineer on Jim's work with it, right? So, um, and I think, I guess that that record ultimately came out later. I I, I actually stayed out of the, because I did I disliked that it was contentious. But I know that certainly have all the details. But I think that that, that was the, the basis of the contention. <laughs> That, yeah, that's it's 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 interesting to just listen to music like just divorced of like all that stuff <laughs> and just be like, oh, yeah, this is a good record. And they'd be like, oh, there's all this like uh, acrimony and like, you know, uh, you know, it, it kind of died on the vine because it didn't, you know, like whatever. It's just interesting, like hearing all that. Like, again, we we're talking earlier about um, things being recontextualized uh, and like context changing uh, and stuff later on. So it's it's kind of interesting to to get into that. I think. um well, Thurwell is so fascinating too. It's interesting. I would love to talk to him sometime. Um, and, and I think of him as another like kind of quintessential New York dude, uh, for lack of a better term, right? Which is like, oh yeah, that's like this guy has been in it like his whole life and like and, and doing doing cool stuff. How did you uh, how how did you meet that guy? How did you meet him? I think I think I met him. Uh, I think it was really via my ex wife. So I think I met him before Lydia, and for some reason. I mean, I think Lydia was there. I just talked to Jim. So Lydia was there, and yeah. somebody ended up talking to Jim because Jim wa- Jim wanted to talk shop. I think it was just that simple. Um, I think he went to talk shop. And I know that my ex-wife, um, my ex-wife met Jim um, maybe even before me and the ex-wife met, you know, because um, because my ex-wife, Lid- uh, Vicky Galvis, is one of Lydia's best friends still and was then. I actually met I actually met Vicky, my ex-wife, at a Lydia lunch show because Vicky was there to see Lydia. And Lydia actually was, you gotta come tonight. So Lydia always gave herself the the props that she was the one that that uh, brought us together, which is right. I guess, true. <laughs> and um so I think I think that well so also my my ex Vicky Galvis, she also was good pals with Lex McNeil. And, sure. Um, great, please kill me. Uh, that's one of my all, the all time great music books, in my opinion. Yeah. So, the, so legs and, and Vicky were good pals, and I remember them. Um, Vicky saying how the first the first time she saw Thurwell uh, perform, and I think it was at, with the name Fetus, was um, uh, he was doing that that shtick. It was very performative and shtick. Like he was putting on a character, very much into doing a character. And it was kind of, I don't like using the word white trash, but I don't, I don't like using that word, but that's kind of, kind of what, what he would try, you know, he would have like a bud, he would have like a bud can, you know, and, yeah. and he was trying, it was like, it was like, uh, like that, it was actually quite like the Rob Zombie kind of aesthetic. Um, so I don't, I don't know if at, I wasn't at this performance, so I don't know if, if, um, if uh, Jim had the uh, impaled pig head, Im- <laughs> impaled pig heads thing happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, but but somehow in that era, so this was before like he would have a band, he would perform. I don't even, I don't know. It, I guess it was sort of p- piped in music, so it was just vocals. But you know, he had. Um, um, uh, I remember at a time, yeah, he would have like two stakes behind him with like imp- impaled. F- pig heads and he would have to uh when he did tours he would have to have that on the rider that the the venue the promoter had to provide fresh pig heads for him so i remember um oh wow he didn't beware <laughs> as my ex, 
<laughs> as my ex-wife was, t- as my ex-wife told me that her and legs and legs were watching Jim and got into a discussion of like, is this punk? What, what is punk? Changing? What is What's so? <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to say too much more about that conversation, but, but that was interesting. How the 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 actually the originator of the word punk, um, and in its in its application to music, legs legs McNeil was that that he was actually watching Jim Thurwell and like that conversation happened of like is this punk, um, so. That's and then somehow shortly after that I met Jim, but I think I met Jim really because he was interested. That's why socially it kind of jumped to me because Jim was like a studio person was interested in working with me in the studio. And it could be back to that old thing that that actually did me pretty well is having started, believe it or not, started in hip hop. Right, I started in hip hop. That's uh, yeah, I start you know to be true, I started in, in I started in hip hop and experimental music, and time time literally when you're that young. You know, a few years is a, an eternity, right? So, uh, years went by um, listening, to, going to see bands like Swans, but not recording them. And then it took years before Sonic Youth called, and then that was like, whoa, a rock band! I didn't hadn't done that before. So it is funny. <laughs> My, I'm, I'm damn, I'm freaking lucky. My first recording session was with Brian Eno. My first rock band was uh, Sonic Youth. That's pretty impressive. I, I, wait, so your first recording session was with Eno? I know that that's, I mean, obviously you had a relationship with it, but that's that's kind of like, wow. Well, I, should, gate. I, should be, I should be clear. The first rec- recording session in this studio. For, for in the space. Yeah, I should clarify. Was right. Eno. But but before that, before that, I didn't, I'd never really even run a session. I just had gone yeah. into the studio with Laswell and Material what, maybe three times? Right. And just sort of helped, made a few comments or like tried to do a little mixing and, you know, but, you know, whatever. So I did a few things, you know, but it, but it, I never, I wasn't really running the session and it was more like I needed an assistant just to know what, what everything did in the studio, you know? So, yeah, in a way, my first real session was, you know, and then, yeah, even if you could say that there was a, a few bands that, that went into a slightly more rock territory. Really, the the first band that was really rock in any kind of sense, or even like punk rock in any sense, really was was Sonic Youth. Um, yeah. And they they've said that that's somewhere out there that Lee Lee was saying that I had generally mostly worked with like beat oriented music, right? And what he means by that is is hip hop. Sure, I sure, yeah. Think, you know what's funny is I don't think I don't think Sonic Youth was that interested in me having worked with John Zorn and stuff like that and the experimental stuff. I don't think that that was really a part of it, weirdly enough. Really? I think that they, I think that they really felt that that was, that there was a distance, there was some daylight between that, like the John Zorn knitting factory huh. kind of scene, you know, they, they, they were like, we are not scrunk basically, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, and it's funny cause like now that distinction is, you know, it, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> like, like it's like the like the people are not even going to like think about those differences now, and it's not going to matter to them like at all. They well, yeah, that's up. what I was saying before. It's it's funny. The, <laughs> these were all these little subgenres were like social movements with like yeah, strict no. values, <laughs> right? right. Exactly. And then now it's like really, who cares what that little really distinction is? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, so a couple things. Uh, the so, so on that you know stuff that was like one of the ambient ones, right? Where um. Uh, was he doing the, the oblique strategies or anything along those lines with any of that? I always find him fascinated by by, uh, by that whole thing. Or was it more just uh, like more like extended out? Because I know, like, I think if I remember, I think pieces of it got used for like different things. And like, um, like it wasn't all like, this is the record, right? It was like more like, here's like the, the big crayon box and let's get going with it. So Yeah, speak. well, no, you're, you're, you're 100% right. And crayon box is a pretty good way to, to put it. it um so we recorded i think with the one month i i think of it as one month but maybe i'm wrong maybe it was more maybe it was a little less but um there was definitely a few weekends there we worked all week and then and then uh eno would go to a farm in um vermont with the other person that was collaborating on the record which i think his name was axel gross who, who actually died like a year later, wow. so that's why maybe I haven't heard of him. So there was is Eno, Axel, and then the members of Material, 
And um, I remember, the, so we worked weeks, weeks, and then weekends, they went up to a farm. So maybe there was three day weekends. I don't know, but that happened a few times. So I, in my mind, Ulton was like a month. And yeah, we recorded piece like, like, um, it felt like we recorded um, uh, pieces of things. Like we would just record sounds. And then I can't remember how or where, what, how exactly they were put together. Um, so I think that even they were, I think that they were on, on the, on land, the, the record is the fourth ambient record. So it's on land. And so there's okay. pieces that got mixed into other songs as I feel like I'm hearing some things on other songs that maybe were recorded here, um, and not credited, but that's kind of okay. Um, it's just little snips snippets. Right. right there's, there's, there, yeah. yeah. Just little, cause we recorded literally all, we, we recorded stuff like rocks, in like a in like a metal box, that's kind of what you said. Like a box of... Awesome. I, I didn't want to elaborate too much on the box of crayons, but when you said box of crayons, I was like, "Oh, that that far off the point." Just... <laughs> that's awesome. It might really, really have been a box of crayons. Um, it might have actually been a box of crayons. Amazing. In, well, there, in there a... definitely was a cigar box that I remember because yeah. I've misplaced the cigar box, but there, I remember the, a cigar box with like rocks and stones in it so i remember like we were recording that somehow in the room and um uh there was, and then i learned that that was a, at the beginning of learning about tape manipulation with brian and uh but then again like pieces like uh here's a loop there's a loop blah, blah 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 and so on 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 the song on the record on land there's one song that's credited fully as having been done here and by the way, I should point out that the studio back then, BC, BC studio now, like before Christ, just like it says on the Sonic Youth record, um, uh, BC studio now was OAO studio then. And OAO, that word was taken from a William Burroughs book um, for Operation All Out. So this was Operation All Out Studios in Gowanus, Brooklyn. And yeah. um, one song on, on land is credited to the studio, and I don't really remember how it came together it sounds a little more cohesive like a piece of music with like a bass line i don't so much was done we were just we were just laying stuff down maybe it was put together a bit somewhere else i, I don't really remember um but you know that was so that was experimental music um the the thing that was was kind of funny and i think eno repeated this at other, other times but there was a day where we had we um we had uh sheets on the walls like you know literally called me from manhattan and said that he had been at the museum of natural history and he okay. he'd gotten all these slides from the gift shop of, of um you know like they have animal diasporas there right they would have you know yeah, yeah. Uh, like, like 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 scene you know they were incredible right? with like uh, like a, a tableau if you will yeah yeah absolutely yeah, so he would bring – so, you know, in all kinds of places on the planet. So there would be like Mount McKinley in the back or Mount Kilimanjaro or, the, or a savanna or a desert or a rainforest. So he – and then he, so he came over with um, projectors and he asked me if I had sheets to put on all the walls, which I kind of did. And he said he'd bring a couple too. So we, so he, he got there. And I guess it's funny. I guess our session started later. That I, I remember them starting early, but what early meant to me back then might be different than what early means to me now. So it might have been like 3 p.m. start or something. So he came. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, it's I all relative. All I was a night, night owl, to say the least. So um, I remember, like, and here's the wall. You can see the cork on the wall. It's all freaking cork. And uh, that cork's from 19, from 1981, um, like brown cork. And um, so I, I, all around the room, I put these sheets and then we put out the projectors. And um, and so the idea was that we were going to like perform stuff with like stones and rocks and then tubes, twirling tubes, all kinds of like were just weird sounds uh, while the projectors would click, click and just change these scenes of like animals and scenes. Right. So th that was that was the thing. And I had a, even a little light thing, I had a little light so that I could just like like see what I was doing on the board. And um you know, I remember Laswell did not like it. Like, like, like he was like, "What the fuck is?" You know, <laughs> Bill, Bill, Bill had come from that like, is why. Um, well, Bill, Bill had come from like funk. You know, Bill Laswell had been in a. When I met him, his his big musical history was playing in like funk bands in the Midwest that would tour the South. 
you know, like black, right, all right. black funk <laughs> bands from the South. So he, he came from that experience. So then to be there with the rocks and the twirly things and then like watching like images of animals and stuff like that seemed like outside the realm of even music. But that was kind of the point. And so I think he was a little annoyed, but also it was funny because he seemed um, a little Laswell was seemed a bit alienated from the world, that kind of experimentalism. But yet what was funny is we would soon with Laswell totally go into John Zorn land. And I thought it was funny. I was like, Oh, you're a little more comfortable now somehow years later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, that's okay. Man. Yeah. <laughs> with like, you know, basic, basically, basically non groove music, like not groove right. music. Right. Yeah. No, no. Cause Bill's all about feel, right. He talks about right. feel a lot. Right. Like that's the magic. And so stuff with like no feel. Right. So, um, so yeah, so there was that moment there with the, the animal things and that was part of on land. And, um, I think somewhere around then, maybe just after that, or just before that bill did end up playing on, um, my life in the butch, my life in the bush of ghosts, which was an interesting collaboration between Brian Eno and David Byrne. And, oh, um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that now. And yeah. has some just like fantastic music in it, and Bill plays some fantastic funky bass, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, you know, what's really funny. Just a quick little anecdote is at the end of uh, twenty twenty one, the end of like mm -hmm. December, last the last few days, I, just after Christmas of twenty twenty one, I stumbled in this studio in this premises. Like, I, well, am I that bad? Like, like, I looked under something that I hadn't looked under in freaking 40 years. And it's like, <gasps> and found and saw tapes that said Eno on them. Right. Oh, so there was like, wow. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> what, what, what was really funny, the reason I mentioned the date and it was the end, it was. It was the end of 2021. If you do the math between my having recorded Eno in, in 81 and my finding this at the end of 2021, it was at the end of the 40th year of the studio. I find this little gem from the first sessions. So I went through a lot of trouble. I got um, my friend Michael Jung from Alice Donut. He, um, yeah. he He's band. good at uh, another great band. He He's good at like remediating tapes and like, so that was, I gave, the job to him and so he was like to figure out what was on these tapes and i can't i actually miraculously got the, got a hold of brian eno's manager and and, and then handed up handed over the tapes uh but actually before handing them over managed to remediate them and play them and yeah. had, had the recording so and that which i also handed over and so we um we were listening and it was weird i think that the tapes was like one tape was like a quarter inch tapes one tape had like what sounded like rough mixes done here. It sounded like material from on land, but not quite like on land kind of stuff, but not nothing. Didn't really sound like anything um, on the record, but maybe so maybe was like other weird. So maybe we were doing compilations or maybe he, but he left the tape here. Right. So I don't know. Maybe he, took stuff from here during the, that during the recording sessions and put something together and then left the tape here. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe we, maybe I just don't remember doing rough mixes. The I manager mean, said that in a while, yeah. you know, like you can't yeah. remember everything. <laughs> yeah. The ma the manager did say that Brian was into doing kind of fancy, fancy rough mixes, which I'm into doing fancy rough mixes too. So that's not so surprising. And then, so that's, so there was two pieces that were fantastic, by the way, just fucking yeah, mind blowing and and sounded like they were from on land. And then there was two other reels that were instrumental, but sounded really kind of funky. The first thing that came to mind was Talking Heads. It sounded like Talking Heads ish, oh, wow. and it also sounded like Laswell playing bass. And um, talking about it with the manager, it kind of realized what I wonder if it's these are outtakes from my life in the Bush of Ghosts. Um, so so me track. me and Michael yeah, track. sure. So me and Michael Jung were just kind of there with our 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 jaws open. So that that. that I would not have recorded because I definitely did not record any music like that with, with Eno, like with African percussion and like a, a yeah. synthesizer, you know, and like a funky drummer. Mm. Like I, I just didn't do that. But anyway, so I found these tapes. That's a little anecdote of leftover from Brian. That's great. Time. <laughs> I mean, like what a find. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. They, what else you got apparently, 
According to, <laughs> La- to, according to um, Eno's manager, there's a thing I think called Lighthouse that they do where they put up like odds and ends and it'll probably go up there so people can comment and awesome. uh, I'll, let, yeah. I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's super cool. Uh, so, you know, we spent, we spent all this time talking. It's been great. We barely talked about your damn record. Uh, oh, which is great. So do you want to, you want to tell us about feral hymns before we have to adjourn here? Uh, cool record. Uh, there's so how, how long did that come to pass? It's not, I mean, it's not your first record. I and mean, you have accredited as, um, as, as just your under your name, but you play, you're playing the songs with the band, the Martin BC band, right? That, that's uh, I know you, I saw you do some touring and, um, originally when we talked about doing this, which was before it came out, uh, and you've got kind of a, a group of people that are, uh, on the record with you. How do you, how do you translate it live? You know, where, where the song's coming from? Um, I mean, it's very New York. <laughs> and, and is that was what I'll say about it? I mean, that is in it as a compliment. It seems very lived in. Yeah, I, I, I take that as a compliment, actually. Um, yeah, uh, uh, feral, <laughs> feral myths. Yeah, it. Um, um, it's funny because almost like I think, I think all my last three records have like one very old song on there. They have one song that really predates um, the bulk of the record. Um, so it's it's kind of funny how uh, it somehow something will happen that doesn't seem part of what I'm doing at that moment and it's just kind of sitting yeah. there and then I kind of realize it's um it belongs to a whole bunch of material that's in the future and that I'm about to to do or whatever um so for instance on my on my song um on my record ex nihilo uh, there was a, a song fine line, which was like two years older than the record than anything else on the record. Yeah. Um, on this, on this record, there's uh, the great, tr- the great trap in the Creek, which is the closing record. The, it's the closing the song. Last, uh, last song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the, it's a last song and it's, it's like a long song and that, that it's a collage of, of like song ideas that were kind of jammed out while we were on tour. So I was, I was with um, uh, Diego Ferry and Oliver Rivera drew drums and bass. Uh, mm-hmm. Oliver plays drums. And uh, we were on tour in Europe and there was the opportunity to go into a studio. And um, and I, I took Genevieve Fernworthy, who works on, um, on he's part of, she's part of the New York band. So I brought her along on the tour. I brought her on to the tour in Europe really just so we could record in that recording studio during a t- tour because it was going to be rare to have the opportunity of getting Genevieve in the same room with Diego and Oliver who are based in in Berlin and it's funny because Diego is a big fan of New York music like he went to see like I found out because I I actually flew Diego to New York just to do the record release of Feral Myths about a month ago at TBI yeah 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 it wasn't that long ago yeah and and it's funny like it turned out that he had seen there was the, 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 the synthesizer player for one of the other bands um this this uh this person, uh, Heather L, in Weeping Icon, turned out she had been in um, uh, Bodega, which is like a very New York-y kind of band. And Diego had seen Bodega in Berlin. So it's funny. This is an, an example of something that happened in the No Way Barrel, which was there was a lot of Berlin happening. Like in, right. in New York. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in New York at the time of like the, the late, set, like early 80s, there was a lot of people from West Berlin, like even Klaus Nomi from West Berlin or from somewhere in Germany, but based in, in Berlin. So it was, there's always been a, 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 a sibling hood between New York City and Berlin, it seems. And it's, it's actually, it goes up and down and now it's kind of back. There's a lot of New Yorkers, expats there. So yes, um, and then Oliver, look, he's an expat. He used to live in New York City and is just always dying to get back into that New York noise and muck. And so he's the drummer on some of the songs in Feral Myth. So and that's that's the the Great Trap in the Creek is um that's the one that goes back to like I think 2018 or something, right? Okay. But somehow okay. didn't make it onto the records then. But then listening back to it, I'm like, wow, I feel like weirdly enough, the material now is finally totally. <laughs> brought that vibe back in where it's, it's very yeah. disorienting and the, the structures are a little bit complicated. And actually that's really has the spirit of it. Like like that song, the last song on the record almost has the 
spirit that some of the other songs that are more realized kind of have, but I want to make sure to not lose the sort of like raw version of it that was just kind of kicked out with when we had that, because that, because that is based on jamming and having just some vague ideas and we jammed those out. So that the, and I embellished in the studio, but great, um, great trap in the Creek is sort of improvised and it has that like hot on tour kind of thing, the chemistry where people right. are really, people really know how to listen are listening and almost magical communication seems to happen. Um, you know, and then it, it actually captures the, the, the two bands. Cause there's, uh, um, also Oliver came from, so it's, it's complicated, you know, so Oliver came from Berlin to at one point for some other reasons. And I was like, Oh my God, I got to record them because I want something of BC studio. The other thing, the other, the great track that was recorded in Sheffield in the UK. So I want, I wanted to get Oliver. I didn't have him on in New York city in BC studio. So that was kind of important. So I got him. And so right. he's on the two songs, um, uh, a storm called Ida, and uh, actually, which is the, the single? Other... It's a great video for that one too, if I remember right. That's uh, that's... yeah, that's the single and the music video. Yep. Um, it's a good tune. So he's on that, and then Avian Invasions, and the then the second single, sing single, which is also going to have a video, and like hopefully within a month, is a uh, mystery of the skin suit, and so uh, Oliver plays on that too, and then the other songs are the New York drummer. So I mean, I don't like things being a hodgepodge, but ultimately. You know, it's up to me as the producer of my stuff and the, is to tie somehow tie it all so it, it it makes sense and feels like it belongs. And, you know, because I really like there to be a narrative that that makes sense. Cohesive, just not just sonically, but also um, philosophically, uh, not to be spiritual, but spiritual even, you know, like it's got to be some spirit that, that that unites everything. So I don't I don't. So the, the hodgepodge is necessary, kind of works against you, I think, artistically, but there's a way to deal with it. And I think and that so that that's definitely 10 percent of the effort on that on the new record on Feral Miss is to try yeah. to, to bring that all together. And then some of it is even it's even the um, um, it's even the. Um, uh, the, the album title, like, and, and the album artwork, because I, um, you, you know, it's funny. It's the album, the, the the album artwork has uh, basically what, what's supposed to be me on fire, right? Yeah, and, I was gonna uh, say the, the flames, but it's like it's like a uh, I don't remember that style of painting, but it's it's more like um, uh, like you can see the paint like with it, but it's it's flames for for, for sure. Yeah, it's it's kind of like impressionistic for sure. Impressionistic, you know? thank you. I could, uh, couldn't think of it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but but for instance, that you know what it was was like someone took a photo of me. Um, that someone. Oh, it would just in case it comes up. There's this woman, uh, Laura Ortman, who is someone I work with, and it was really weird during the Black Lives Matter marches. Just by complete miracle, she was at her window on Flatbush Avenue, saw me in the middle of the street. There was no one around me, but I was sort of like in motion and yeah. coming down, coming down Flatbush Avenue was um, a line of protesters with like a banner, you know, George Floyd or right. something. And they were marching yeah, yeah, down yeah. Flatbush Avenue towards me. And then on the other side was police, a line of police, like a, two blocks away. And I was sort of in the middle, but in the photo. So she, because she's a photographer too. So she took a picture of me and at that moment, and she sent me the picture. She goes, she goes, I saw you today. I'm like, huh, what? And she sent, texted me a photo. Holy shit. She was at her window. It's complete That's crazy. wild. But, but that became, yes, it was wild. I'm glad you used the word wild. So it kind of, that photo, which I really liked, right? It wasn't going to make it on the album. But then that was that feeling of like, because that, it was an interesting time in New York. Like, like, like yeah. New York was kind of feral. You know, it was kind of wild. There wasn't really a lot of authority there, you know, and even just on my um, on in that photo here I was with the authorities on one side and autonomous people, you know, who streets, our streets, you know, on the other side. Um, so that so there was something about the the, the uprise, the George Floyd Floyd up, up, uprising that sort of gave that feeling of of ferality. And, you know, like today I finally Today, literally, I posted a, a clip of the video from a storm called Ida, and yeah. I felt like saying I felt like saying something I hadn't said before about it. And I said something very simple. I said, without thinking about the al album title, I said, 
tale of a wild night because the storm called Ida is about when the hurricane Ida slammed into Gowanus, it's, Brooklyn. Yeah, just wreaked havoc. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone, someone fucking drowned like on the street, yeah. right? This is yeah. with the flooding. So, um, and it was an intense, freaky night. It was a night thing, really a night thing. And then I, um, so I just said about a storm called Ida, I said, a, I said, a tale of a wild night. And then it just clicked with me. I go, then the next sentence was why it's on my album, Feral Myths, right? Like I just kind of I'm like, duh, wow. I'm sometimes I'm not that smart. Like that's, that was the <laughs> you figured it out though. So that's good. <laughs> like, wow. Like that's why, that's why that song is on this record. And I realize it now, like two months yeah. after the record comes out, like today. So it's funny because I'd always felt like, the, the storm called Ida that there was something about it that belonged sonically on the, on the record, but why exactly is it a feral myth? And then it struck me that, that, that there was a, a, a tale of wildness when guess who was in charge? Nature was in charge. You know, Ida was in charge. Yep. <laughs> you know, that was our Lord master and, and, and overseer and state was the storm, not this other stuff. So that's, so there you go. Feral myths. I think it's a rad record. I think it's interesting. I think there's a lot to love there. I'll uh, throw a link to it in the, the band camp in the show notes so people can check it out if they're uh, interested in checking it out. Martin, this has been awesome, dude. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been great having you. Last thing, this is the only can question I ever ask anybody. And Yes, uh, go ahead. You can uh, choose interpret it however you like, but why do you do what you do? Oh, uh, well, part of the answer is, is, um, how did I, why did I start doing what I do? Right. So, cause I've been pretty much doing sound and being in sound since 1978. Um, right. When I was uh, volunteering at CBGB's to do sound now and then, and trying to learn and getting a little like tutorial on the side from when the sound people at, at, um, uh, at CBs and then, is uh, literally uh, the same reason I wrote graffiti up until like 1978. So I, I, I wrote graffiti from 1974 through 1978 and then switched to like doing sound. It's, it's like, you know, I think I kind of, I liked the idea of being part of something bigger than myself and something that was happening. And you can read into it that part of that is the trope of wanting to be cool. Yeah, okay, I was trying to be cool. Well, because there was a lot of cool people, <laughs> there was, you know, yeah. a lot of cool stuff happening. So it's, it can, it's forgivable that I wanted to be cool when, I, when, you know, the people I was dealing with were, were like, you know, the, the band DNA, like trying to do sound for them in 1978 or like the, I was doing sound for like the lounge lizards. And, you know, so, yeah. um, um, so I can be forgiving for wanting to be cool. Like, like John Lurie, although I didn't look anything like John. I didn't look like John Lurie or dress like John Lurie. I'd look how I dressed. <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't shake off the, graf I didn't shake off the graffiti hippie thing for a long time. I had like a headband and beads and I had like, like purple pants that were covered with paint. So, and that, that's, and, and so that's how I would go to the mud club, you know? So, um, I didn't shake that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it was but very simply, it's like, I, I recognize instinctively Actually, that there was something incredible happening. Also, I was influenced by the 60s. I grew, I grew up in the 60s. I remember the 60s. I remember the East Village. I remember Lower Manhattan in the 60s. Then I remember how revolution was in the air. My parents would talk about revolution. They used the word revolution. It was like a revolution happening. That's what I thought. Um, so um, I really felt like, and, and the revolution clearly had petered out by the time of the mid seventies. It was kind of obvious that the city did, the city looked nothing like it did during the sixties. Uh, right. It was emptied out. There was a lot of things that were very, very different, but there was still a spirit that I yearned for that was revolutionary. And, and, and I'm using the term like vaguely, you know, and artistically even really. Um, and, and it felt like musically, it was like, you know, just like I did graffiti, it was like illegal art. Of course, I want to do illegal art. That's what I would want to do. You know, so when I was doing, when so for me to do sound and get involved with this stuff, I mean, it felt like, like sonic revolution. Like it really felt that way to me. Right. And um, 
it also was a community based because it was, you know, my parents had just died. Right. So uh, my, my mom died when I was 12 and my dad when I died when I was 17. So my dad was was terminal cancer when I was trying to do sound at CBGBs. So I was looking for a chosen family, basically. So um, I, I really related to hardcore, I really related to the, what would eventually be the hardcore scene because I was another lost youth that needed exactly needed what hardcore provided, which was accessible music, $5, all ages, $5, all ages saved my life in a lot of ways. So I got involved because that was the only thing I could see to do. Like I wasn't really, I, I kind of was a musician. I played drums, but somehow that wasn't really clicking for me. And what I was interested in, interestingly enough, what I was interested in playing on drums had like nothing to do with punk. Right. I was, I was playing like prog. I was playing like nine, I was playing in like nine and then switching to seven. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, very, <laughs> I was really a complicated drummer. Very weird, but that was in the zone. But you know, you know why? Because I was into no wave basically and punk, you know, at night. But what I, the stuff I listened to at home really was a lot of prog. So I would listen to like, you know, Frank Zappa and Terry Bozio on drums and stuff like that. So yeah, I was, very, yeah, yeah. I was an, and yeah. not admitting it too, right? Because it was not really like prog. It wasn't was, cool. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't cool. So I wasn't really talking about it, you know, but that's what I was. So basically, I was like, I saw a niche of something that could be done, which had to do with audio and sound. That's sure. why I picked it. And that's also why even to this day, I'm not a gearhead. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a gearhead because I don't love gear. You know, that's not why I ever did it. So I didn't come at it because I really felt that I'm an engineer at heart and I love gear and I just can't way to work with it. it has nothing to do with that at all it just i just want to be in the pot in the pie in the you know i want to i want to be in that in the the fishbowl swimming around and a little fish so i uh, yeah so um that's why i got into it for all those other juvenile reasons and uh then i just uh stayed with it because i love and need community and it worked for me and i tend to in a lot of ways, in a lot of things in my life, I tend to not really reinvent the wheel and not change things until it's obvious that they need to be changed. In fact, friends of mine are always trying to say, hey, you know, Martin, sometimes change can be good because I don't change. I'm in the same place as 1981. I do the same thing. <laughs> you're, finding, you're finding tapes from 40 years ago that are, <laughs> you know. And getting excited by it. So it's like, I don't, I mean, so, so it's true. The friends of mine that go, hey, you know, there's something to be said for change. Yeah, and they got a point, and it's just never really been my way. Even like I, I didn't even go digital until it was like obvious I had to go digital. I, I just stuck with not just t using tape, but a hundred percent tape, well into the Pro Tools era. And even now, I use Pro Tools five. Yeah, it's <laughs> the, the fucking computer is like a G four. <laughs> It's a, you know, people, it's, yeah. I, I think people, it's a people fair light of recording. Yeah. <laughs> people are laughing, you know, but it doesn't matter. They're hearing what they want to hear and they, they, they want to be an environment. They want to work with some OG. They want OG on doing the session. So that's what they get. And they're happy with it. I think it's funny. You know, it's obvious they think it's funny, but you know, um, you see the Instagram post you know, that someone from the studio when they're bored and they're going on my G4 computer 90s, you know. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> DC studio 90s, old school. But, you know, so I, I, I so I got into it and then just stayed in it, you know. And, and because I, I finally felt um, the more I knew, the more I understood, the more I could kind of contribute, you know. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's. It also is a bit of an anarchist thing, you know. It's it's like we're we're a world here that's doesn't that obviously doesn't rely that much on the market. Uh, most of what I do doesn't get doesn't get state funds, doesn't get market funds. It's just is what it is. So it's it's we're operating outside of these like greater societal parameters. So in a sort of politic, in a sort of politics of it, and that's even what I said. I see the studio as a bit of a community sector in a way too. So I see it kind of in that frame and and i, I i'm not to be honest with you like it during the napster period i was almost ready to, to to walk away from the studio because i just thought the album is done um uh, home studio is kind of the way it's going maybe that's the way it should go it's getting more democratized all the sounds have been done and people are just like rehashing the sounds there's no new no real new sonic stuff and no one cares about albums that much anymore. i i thought that it, it, the days were waning and i I was I felt tethered to the stu studio. Why am I tethered to the studio? Um, and then someone made a um, a documentary about the studio, right? So there was the documentary yeah, Sound, and, yeah. Yeah, Sound and Chaos. 
And then that was super well received, weirdly enough, like in the local media, like Brooklyn media, like like it was news that there was a recording studio that was 35 years old. I mean, like, you know, Gowanus, Brooklyn, might as well be Coney Island, right? So that, so I was like, oh, actually, people give a shit about this. And then, so then what that made me feel was a certain stewardship. Then I started feeling like, I have a little bit of a responsibility to kind of keep this space going and, and that it's appreciated. So it's all a mix, but that's basically what it is. It's, it's the essence of is really the conception, just like anything. It's like you are when you're born, you know? And so when it's born, that's what, uh, um, you know, I think philosophically a lot happens when you're young, you know, like you, you just, you carve out your course and then it's a big deal to change courses and you, you might have to, or you might want to, but there's not that many. You can't, it's not, you know, you kind of, you, you, you got to stick with something for a while, generally, right? Ain't that the truth. <laughs> Martin, thank you so much, man. This has been great. It's been so great having and you. And thank you. And yeah, thank you out there, current and future watchers. Pr- appreciate you so much and uh, lo- love having you and uh, take it easy, dude. Appreciate Black, it. And, and thank you for doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Glad to do it. Glad to do it. Thanks, sir. All right, there he goes, Mr. Martin BC. What a, what a freaking awesome dude, man! Like, uh, uh, thank you so much for sticking around with it. Let's hear his uh, the first single, uh, Storm Call Ida, off of the Feral Mess record. Uh, thanks so much for listening, everybody. Uh, this has been Proton Commercial. <laughs> Yeah.